Greetings folks, Tyler with Understand Contract Law and You Win dot com here. In this series of ineffective or failed procedures, uh, we're going to go over the first, probably most common procedure that I see and that has not been working and that people ask about and email me about and say, can you tell me why this isn't working? I found so-and-so website and went with this process and it has not worked. I've got up to this point. Now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lost for, uh, you know, words with a uh, um, direction to go. Can you please help me? And unfortunately, I tell people, you know, there's nothing that I can do because I'm not the proponent of that process. So the process is the use of your own promissory note to pay your own debt or perhaps someone else's debt. You know, I've seen people try to pay their parents mortgage or, or student loan or whatever with their own promissory note. Uh, for, for the sake of simplicity, I wrote this up. Um, dealing with people trying to, you know, quote, pay off their own uh, mortgage or uh, bills using their own, uh, their own promissory note. And it, either way, it doesn't work if you try to do it for someone else as well. So we're just going to, we're going to go through the, um, the, uh, the other aliases or, or names for the process. Uh, this process is also referred to as the LPN or a little promissory note process or the promissory note substitution process um, the process this is a sample of a uh, promissory note it has a signature medallion guarantee stamp and barcode it has a whole bunch of UCC laws and all sorts of uh, signatures which I covered up here um, uh, it looks like it's for $100,000 of certified funds, remit, and pay via Fedwire. So, you know, the thing is, is people can print, let's see, warning this document has security features in the paper. This is maker's firm and unconditional promise to pay to the, the, the bearer or the order of City Mortgage, Inc., At site days after not available, amount one hundred thousand United States dollars. This note instrument is legal tender for all debts, both public and private, private payable in United States dollars from the so and so estate slash trust. City mortgage account number, blah blah blah. Federal Reserve trace exemption, IRS Treasury exemption, identification number, United States registered collateral bond number. This instrument is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government pursuant to 31 USC subsection 3123 notes and mortgage loans payoff medallion signature guarantee stamp all right very interesting well you know if you're going to put that the if you're going to create an instrument and say that the instrument is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government uh, that's a pretty big claim. I I would say you can get into a lot of trouble if that happens not to be the true. I mean, I mean how can how, how are you able to make a claim that something that you create is backed by the United States government? Well, either way, the code is on here, 31 USC 3123, which we will be looking up. And um, uh, one of the things I'll show you is that 31 USC 3132 does not say what it does it will look it up it read it it doesn't make any sense as to it doesn't give any authority for a private individual to make a promissory note and to claim that it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government this isn't is not true um, there's a whole bunch of other laws on here too UCC 3104 negotiable instrument 12 USC 411 18 USC subsection 8 redeemable and lawful currency of exchange um, no 
no um no um see the whole the whole point of negotiable instruments is that they're not redeemable in lawful currency we we've gone away from that so i i, I don't know how somebody can look at laws that were passed in the 1930s and way long time ago and not have read all the laws that have been passed since that have you, you, you cannot redeem pieces of paper promissory notes and other um, you know admiralty law uh, uh, debt instruments you, you cannot redeem them in lawful currency of exchange so just because you write something on there and say something doesn't mean that it's it's correct secondly city mortgage to, to, to have successfully cancel your city mortgage um, remaining uh, balance due on this account here do you think city mortgage cares if this is redeemable and lawful currency of exchange I don't think they care they just want the um, credits to clear in their bank when they when they uh, when they when they cash it so anyways let's let's continue to read on here this is the uh, little promissory note process um, or some people may not call it a little promissory note however there's a uh, marketer on the internet calling this process the little promissory note process I think it's a marketing tactic to uh, increase sales and uh, try to show people how easy it is you know when you say oh this is just a little promissory note process it's kinda just uh, a way to convince people oh, okay I can pay off all my debts with a little promissory note rather than telling people uh, it's a Promissory note uh, or a big promissory note. I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't really buy the. I don't really buy the little. Throwing the word little in there doesn't seem too authentic. That it's really. Uh, um, whether you call it a little promissory note or whether you call it a promissory note, um, it just seems to me the only uh, reason you might throw it throw it in there is just for marketing and branding purposes, and maybe to convince people. Uh, you know how simple it is because customers are going to want to buy something the simpler and easier it is um, so um, it's kind of like an infomercial you know you see vacuum cleaners on the infomercial and if someone says oh you get this little vacuum cleaner it'll make your cleaning so much easier um, <laughs> anyways let's 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 kind of dive right in here the process being espoused the, the process being promoted is drafting up a unilateral promissory note okay what's the definition of unilateral because there are legitimate promissory notes unilateral means signed and drafted and having a meeting with the minds only with you and not by the other party so this is in contrast with a um, meeting of the minds sitting at a table you know when when someone's interested in buying a house and they get their notaries and they get their attorneys and they sit down at the table and have a meeting of the minds and they both sign documents together um, that's 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 bilateral so this process is a uh, claim that you can unilaterally uh, write all this stuff down and put the dollar amount there and say all these make all these claims on here and sign it and try to use this instrument to pay a debt that you uh, are unwilling or cannot afford to pay and trying to force the party to accept it via stealth and via a technicality because of the um, technicality that you deliver it to them and they kept it for more than three days or they kept it for more than ten days and even though a lot of the information on here we will debunk as being uh, false claims um, the um, fact that they keep it and what you're claiming that this has the authority to do um, should do you know they should follow um, what uh, you're telling them to do which it could make sense it, it, it does work that if you if you mail someone an offer in the mail and something is a valid uh, instrument and they keep it um, you do have a right to enforce that claim by them not performing if they keep the money and they do not perform yes um, it's kind of like if I pay one of my, you know, auto insurance bills or, uh, you know, car, car payment bills and I send them, uh, you know, a regular valid, 
uh, legitimate prom you know check or money order or or um, Federal Reserve notes or uh, you know other valid instrument that they that we already have a contract that they that, that they must accept and if they fail to cash the check um, I, I, they're they're failing to perform on their contract and yes I can uh, force them to perform however that whole presumption is based that, that that whole process of is based upon the presumption that all the claims that you're making on the instrument are valid so as you can see on this on this instrument there's a lot of claims on this promissory note there's a lot of claims there's probably over 35 different claims that I could that you can point out and read and and say there's you know there's there's a lot there's 25 30 35 claims on here this is not like a regular check drawn off of a regular uh, bank account that we're all used to or this is not drawn off of the post office via postal money order so you know it has a lot of stuff to inspect and if any one of the claims on here is not accurate then it invalidates the entire instrument so you know in a sense this process might work if you didn't put so many claims on it if you just kept it simple and kept to the simple components of a promissory note um, I guess there's a way to make it possibly have it have a better chance of working um, rather than putting all this stuff on here because if any of these things on here are wrong then um, the whole instrument is invalid so Um, okay, when the when the receiving party truly does not want to accept it. So if the receiving party is saying, well, this is not valid, we're not going to, you know, all the time they're going to write back and respond to you and say, nope, this is not a valid promise or note. And they don't have to tell you why, because they have their lawyers and they have, if you ever sue them, they know what they're going to say to show the judge that this is not valid. So they're going to, you know, they're, they're going to, they might point out why it's invalid. They might point out why some of the stuff you put on here is, you know, or some of the bells and whistles and components or not on here. If there's a if there's a um, a number of bells and whistles or um, in, in, in indicia of uh, 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 let's see, um, it, it's kind of like you see some creature in the woods walking around. Is it a is it a gorilla? Is it is it is it a monkey? Is it is it a human? Is it a, is it a uh, you know is this Bigfoot? You know, you're trying to look through magnifying glass, I mean, uh, binoculars. You're trying to look from up in a tree, and you see this, like, hairy, like, creature. It looks like it's walking on two feet. It looks like it's got two eyes. It looks like it's got a nose. It looks like it's got a mouth. It looks like it's got um, one thumb on each hand and uh, a few fingers on each hand. It looks like it's, uh, you know, got, um, it looks like it's a male. It looks like it's got, gen you know, male genitals between its legs. It looks like it's got, you know, it's, it looks like it's, uh, uh, you know, urinating and uh, defecating. Uh, it's walking around. It's ripping off leaves off of the trees and eating it. You know, you're looking at all these different things. Eyes, hands, thumbs, hair. Um, you know, you're looking at all, you know, drinks water. You're looking at all these all these um, bells and whistles, so to speak, to try to determine, is, is this a homo sapien? Is this a uh, uh, homo erectus? Is this a uh, chimpanzee? What, what, what is this thing? You know, what, what is this? And if if any one item is different, then it's not a human being. It's not a, it's not a Homo sapien species, right? So it's the same thing like this here. We it may have some of the components of a of a of a Homo sapien, but it may be uh, it may be categorized as something else, and therefore it's uh, not a human, and it doesn't uh, can't breed with other humans. Uh, it's not uh, the same, so um, let's go into let's go into why. Let's let's kind of summarize again here. I said I said in a, in a theoretical sense, what might work instead? Okay, just because I have to tell you what I have to tell you what does work with promise, promissory notes. Obviously, you know, ever since uh, we stopped, you know, ever since we started trading over the Atlantic Ocean and so on and so forth, and um, you know we. We created banknotes and promissory notes and stuff because you're not going to put gold and silver on a big boat and have the boat possibly sink to the bottom of the ocean. So 
we created um, uh, certificates of manifest, bills of exchange, promissory notes, things like that in order to facil facilitate international trade, international commerce. If it further uh, escalated into that system when, um, you know, the, the, the Western countries of the world went into bankruptcy and, you know, securitized their, uh, their assets and their people and their, um, you know, their assets for uh, uh, national uh, debt to the, to the international bankers. I mean, we further escalated into, um, you know, full-blown, uh, uh, you know, debit, credit, you know, world uh, IMF, world banking, you know, system. Um, and obviously it works. Obviously we're familiar with promissory notes every single day. So what makes this promissory note process that's being espoused online uh, and attempted by many, many people for the last, you know, 10 years or so, or however long it's been go this has been uh, purported, what makes this different than the process, the, the, the real promissory note process? Okay, well, let's let's read what, I, what we wrote here. Using a promissory note, what would work is using a promissory note, a promise to pay in writing, expressed in writing, and signed and dated, and etc., that you are the holder in due course for, that you purchased via a duly authorized commercial transaction in which you have a bill of sale for, and which you are collecting monthly payments from the debtor. That doesn't, you don't have to be collecting monthly payments because some promissory note contracts can be, uh, you know, balloon payments, right? You could, you could borrow money from the bank and, or, or a private individual or a private businessman and the contract can be, um, you're not going to pay any monthly payments. You're just going to make one balloon lump sum payment 30 years from now. And, you, you know, you borrow money from me now and 20 years from now you're going to pay me double the amount. Okay, so it doesn't have to be monthly payments. I'm just kind of giving giving an example that we're all familiar with so that I can kind of show you the difference between the valid promissory note process and the invalid promissory note process, okay? So what I'm saying here is there is a valid commercial transaction, a valid bill of sale, a valid contract, all the components to make a valid contract where somebody signed a promissory note that they are... They're not defrauding. They're not falsifying their promise. They're standing upon their promise. And they are creating um, a series of actions, like making at least three monthly payments in a row. They're making a series of actions. They're making, maybe they're still making, maybe they've been paying on this promissory note for the, the last year and a half. And they're still making monthly payments. They're still, they're not falsifying their promise. It's a valid See if you create a contract or a promissory note and you don't and you falsify your promise immediately thereafter, then it's an invalid, it's a it's a fraudulent promissory note. So if you prove through your actions that you are honoring the agreement, that helps to validate the contract. And the instrument itself, and what people comp in the world of commercial paper and chattel paper, there's a whole market on the stock market, and there's a whole market of uh, people that invest in um, um, usually these these promissory notes, and usually these uh, instruments are um, bonds are created off of these notes and the bonds are bundled together and um, securitized it basically means turning them into securities basically turning them into stocks and different mutual funds and pension funds and retirement funds and just private investors and just private individuals and, and corporations can invest in these um, stocks directly or the mutual funds that have a variety of different mortgage securities or student loan securities or criminal bond securities etc and people the investors are entitled to the dividends or entitled to the um the uh, their share of the monthly payments that the borrower are is paying okay so there are there are investors that pay the middlemen and when you're making your mortgage payment, when you're making your student loan payment, your credit card payment, they're actually investors that are receiving your, your money rather than the bank receiving your money. Now, there may be a 
bunch of intermediaries. There may be broker dealers. There may be you know the the DTC. There may be many different um, middlemen, but that's essentially what's you know what's happening. So what happens is, and you know, there's a great video on. Um, there's a great video on. Um, if you type in YouTube holder in due course, there's a great there's a bunch of great cartoon videos. Uh, if you type in holder in due course into uh, YouTube, there's a bunch of videos. It's kind of small to read here. I'm not going to go over this. not a video where I'm going to play 10 different videos about holder in due course. Okay. You should pause this and you should do some research on this before or after this video if you really want to understand this. Okay. But these are, you know, the businessprofessor.com. These are videos of college. There's a few in here. College professors. Um, oh, this is a great one. This is one of my favorite ones. There's a there's a great video here. The Holder and Due Course Blues. Negotiable Instruments. Shelter Rule. Okay, and as you'll see in this in this animated illustration, you will understand what Holder and Due Course is. Basically. You don't have to be, here you go, HDC, you'll folder a new course. People can buy and sell promissory notes from one another. Okay? And I, I, I hear all the time people say, oh, well, the uh, bank sold my note and there's some random other company. That's 100% valid. People claim, oh, I never signed a contract with this company. It doesn't matter. According to international law international commercial law uniform commercial code which every state and every nation has adopted party a can buy a note from party b which is collecting on party c and then that new party becomes the party entitled to enforce and collect the instrument even if you've never signed a contract with them there's, there's no way around that. It's 100% valid anywhere in the world. So you really got to get that through your head. There's, there's a lot of videos on here. These little cartoon videos. This this video is like a four and a half, four and a half minute like uh, blues song that helps you to remember and memorize. You know, remember when we were kids and we would sing songs on Sesame Street to remember, you know, the alphabet and like. You know, different colors and different countries and different things. Um, I feel like <laughs> we all need to go back to, uh, you know, kindergarten and uh, start singing songs that help us and have little cartoons and stories and stuff that help us to remember things easier because, you know, now it's a little bit hard to just kind of like study like robotically, like, you know, bullet points and have some college professor. You got to, you got to, cartoons, you'll remember the cartoon, right? So if, if you study that, you will understand how you could buy a promissory note from your, or let's say your friend loaned some business, some uh, entrepreneur a hundred thousand dollars. Well, and signed a promissory note. Well, you can go and you can sign the promissory, the back of the promissory note. Someone could flip the prom promissory note around, say, pay to the order of um, your name, right? Now you, all you have to do is show that that promissory note has been endorsed to you. And that you paid at least you know a dollar or ten dollars for it, and now you're the party entitled to enforce the contract. This this promissory note has been assigned to you, and that would make you the holder in due course. Okay, there's a difference between holder and holder in due course, but that would make you the holder in due course. What does that mean? In due course means basically in the due in the ordinary. Due means or, ordinary in the ordinary course of international commercial endeavors. You paid a dollar, ten dollars, a thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, whatever. You paid money and can prove that you paid for this note. Now you have a right to collect against the borrower. Okay? So if you did that and you paid money and bought the note that was originally between two other people, then 
you're the one collecting monthly payments. You're the one collecting um, a future balloon payment, a future lump sum payment. And if that process was all valid and you did that, then you, you can negotiate the note. Let's say that you were the original part, the original party that loaned money, or you were the holder in due course, a, sec, a, a third party. Uh, now you're coming in as a third party debt collector. Now you own the rights to the proceeds from that borrower, okay, or from that issuer. So now you can negotiate that note again to somebody else. So if you happen to actually put money down and pay money for to be the the new um, collector and the new owner and the new holder in due course of the note, uh, that note is valuable. That note has future revenue, future um, certified funds. You know, if you you know you can you can certify that hey, this borrower has been paying you know Bank of America uh, you know three thousand dollars a month. And now I'm the I'm the collector. Now they're paying me three thousand dollars a month. That note can be negotiated to somebody else because actual funds flowing through and that are expected to flow through. So you can negotiate the note to a third to another third party if they accept it in order to offset a debt that you owe that other party if you, if, if they would agree to it. Right, you, it's it, it's money. It's just like it's just like if you own stock in uh, you know successful uh, stock like Apple or Facebook or Amazon. You you own stock in the company. Well, take your stock certificates and negotiate them and say, hey, uh, you know, I don't have any cash right now to pay off the rest of my um, what I owe to uh, to to Citibank. Um, what if I sell you some of, some of my stocks? And if you sit down at the table and they agree with it and they evaluate it and they're you know, review uh, the, the bank reviews it and says, you know what? Yeah, okay, we you know we'll take this. Okay, that's a valid process. Um, I don't think a lot of you know banks have departments that review homeowners trying to um, negotiate other assets rather than just writing checks and money orders. They don't really have a division that does that. And when you sign the mortgage, when you sign the contracts, they don't leave a loophole for you to do that so it, it doesn't really that's not really a valid process um, because uh, in the uh, as we can see when we pull up and actually read one of the mortgage contracts it says that you can pay them in check comma money order comma EFT certified funds period it doesn't say you can negotiate stocks doesn't say you can negotiate um, other notes and instruments or assets so even that is an invalid process, but at least if they accepted it, it could be a valid process. Whereas writing your own promissory note that is fraudulent and fictitious because you're not making payments on it is not is completely different. Writing your own promissory note for yourself that has no value because there's no income coming from it and there's no intent on income coming from it is false. How do you know that the intent of the person who signed it is valid? Well, are you making monthly payments on it? Or are you, you know, was there a uh, was there electronic transfer when this when this note was uh, tried to be cashed? Well, there's no electronic transfer because there's no routing numbers for any bank where there's any certified funds. So basically, um, in order to for this uh, note to have validity, you don't know unless there's some sort of um, performance that the issuer of the note is actually sending money in, in regards to the promissory note. Now, you see why this process is, is so stupid? Because if people are using promissory notes that need to be validated by you making payments in order for them to prove that they're valid, the whole point that people are trying to do this on the internet is people are trying to not pay the banks. So, it, it, you know, this... this Given the fact that okay, there might be some 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 misquoted codes and way too much information that now we have to inspect to see if it's all valid. Okay, aside from that, if this was just a simple promissory note that said promissory note, I promise to pay, same mortgage, blah blah blah. Well, that might be valid if you actually started to make the payments on it. So your actions show whether it's a valid note or not. If it's a fault and Here's, here's, a, here's the reason why it's presumed on its face, 
prima facie on its face by the bank to be invalid. Because if you already you already have signed a promissory note to them that you've already dishonored related to the same account number, related, you know, to the same account. And in order to create a different account number, you have to have a uh, refinance or modification or consolidation, which is a whole process that needs the vice presidents of the bank signatures on it. So you don't, you can't put a new account number. So you got to put the old account number. And if you put the old account number on this, it's really just a derivative of the same account. And you, you already have been failing to pay the promissory note. Yeah, I mean, you already have been failing to pay or... Or you haven't been failing to pay. Let's say you're making a monthly mortgage payments. Then what's the point of sending this? You already are. You already have made a promise to pay on this account to this entity, and there's no validity for a substitution of a promissory. You you already have a promissory note that you signed at the day of the closing when you bought the house and mortgaged the house. So why are you putting together a new promissory note? It's completely invalid because there's no, you know, there's no validity to substitute you know a unilateral promissory note with an old promissory note that has everybody's consent and signatures on it this doesn't have everybody's you know uh bilateral consent so back to holder in due course and what could quote unquote could work although it's not a, it's not it, this is not again in in your in your contract with the bank it doesn't doesn't give you the loophole to do this but i'm just i'm just saying that if you did buy if you were a holder in due course and you actually put money down to buy notes, you, you can collect against those borrowers. And so that you have an income stream. So you do have an asset and it is valid. So in, in hypothetical sense, you can negotiate your hold your notes that you're the holder in due course of to other parties that you're trying to contract with, that you're trying to pay, that you're trying to offset debts with. You can try to uh, negotiate them yet again to a you know fourth party debt collector um, and see if they accept it's it's an asset stocks and notes and bonds are all assets if they uh, have um, the bells and whistles of uh, validity of uh, future certified funds you know flowing flowing through so anybody who's reasonable would sit down at the table with you and consider your offer if you get their attention um, so you can negotiate those notes to third parties, fourth parties, fifth parties to offset debts you have with them upon them overtly consenting. It's a brand new contract, it's a brand new meeting of the minds. You can't just send it to them and say they kept it. They have to overtly, in that scenario, they have to overtly consent and sign a new bill of sale and a new you know offset agreement with you because because the majority of the of the contracts, you know, you know. These companies and lawyers are not stupid. They're not just going to. They're not just going to create a contract with you that says, um, you know, you owe us three hundred thousand dollars, but and you could pay us with any asset in the world. No, if you read mortgage contract, if you read the student loan promissory note and the contract, they give. They say check, comma money order, comma EFT. Okay, that's it. They don't say you can sell. You can trade us stocks, bonds. You know, promissory notes that you purchase from other parties. They don't say that. So in order to get them to accept it, they'd have to overtly, bilaterally accept it and have it all in writing, which they're not going to do. Although they can, you know, they have the ability to open up to you and do that, but why would they do it with millions of customers? I mean, who, who are you to them? Just pay them regularly. That's all that they're, that's all they have the resources to, you know, to consider. They have millions of customers and only hundreds or thousands of executives and managers, so... Imagine if you were running a company and you had millions of customers and you only had, let's say, you know, 200 bank vice presidents. Are you going to go and open up the doors to renegotiate and hear um, every single one of the millions of customers that say, oh, I have, a, I have a baseball card collection. I have a Pokemon collection. I have a Pogs collection. I have a collection of fine art. And you're going to have bank vice presidents go down and hire assessors to see if the fine art is really, you know, Leonardo da Vinci's paintings or if it's a fraud. You're going to go and have people come and check out your collectible coins and weigh all your collectible gold, silver, bald eagle coins. No, nobody has time for this. Nobody wants this. They just want the funds. They just want the, a check that clears through the normal banking system. So that's why it's it's an assembly line. Imagine, do you run a business? Are you an entrepreneur? Do you want, do, I mean, do you sell uh, sandwiches? And, uh, you know, maybe you run a deli and you sell sandwiches and salads and stuff. 
you want people coming onto Line instead of just paying you with their credit cards, instead of just paying you with bills, do you want someone to come and say, um, what if I sell you this, what if I exchange like this piece of fine art? What if I sell you like my old Pokemon collection? What if I sell you like this, uh, this, you know, 1992 Topps, you know, baseball card from, you know, you know, whatever, some, uh, Frank Thomas, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, left fielder for the Chicago White Sox. And, you know, this card is worth, uh, $25. How about I give you this baseball card in, in mint condition in exchange for a sandwich, a bag of chips, and a, and a Coca-Cola and, and a vitamin water? I mean, it's ridiculous. Come on, people. Do you have any business sense whatsoever? If you run a business, do you really want everybody coming in there trying to negotiate with you? No. You just want the current day currency, the current day medium of exchange that everybody accepts. Otherwise, you have the right to say, no, I don't I don't want your bag of, um, you know, old clothes. I don't want your bag of, you know, I don't want I don't want to look at your your shoes. I don't want to look at, you know, you know, artwork. I don't want to look at, um, you know, I, I don't want to I don't want to buy your old, you know, I don't want to exchange your old television set. I just pay, I'm trying to run a business. I'm trying to serve as many customers as possible here. And I just want to be paid in the normal medium of the day that everybody accepts in, in regular, you know, average everyday currency. I mean, that's it. So, be, you know, have common sense. Do to others what you would expect others to do for you if you are a business owner. In simplicity, back to this what could work section. In simplicity, if you become a third-party debt collector and pay using U.S. dollars to be the assignee on another's obligation, basically if you buy debt or stocks. However, as a practice, companies offering accounts to Joe Blow consumer, being you know you and millions of other consumers, do not participate in negotiation of anything other than checks, money orders, HH transfers, EFTs as satisfactory payments. And you can pull up, read your mortgage contract, read the contract. It does say that in there. And in, in this uh, video series, I will pull that up to you and show you. Well, actually, I think I know exactly where that is. I think I can pause this video and pull that up and show it to you that that's the only um, way that they accept payments. Let me try to find that. Let me try to find that file for a second. Pause recording. Okay, so I'm back. So as you can see, I have pulled up a mortgage from some of my files. Okay. And you've got, uh, where are we here? Here you go. In the section in the mortgage where the borrower makes covenants, which are essentially promises, uniform co covenants, borrower and lender covenant and agree as follows. Payment of principal interest, escrow items, prepayment charges, and late charges. Borrower shall pay when due the principal of and interest in the debt evidenced by the note and any prepayment charges and late charges due under the note. Borrower shall also pay funds for escrow items pursuant to Section 3. Payments due under the note. And this security instrument shall be made in U.S. currency. So they're not saying that you can pay with stocks, bonds, baseball card collections, Pokemon card collections, or anything else. And then it goes on to say... If any check or other instrument received by a lender as payment on the note of the security instrument is returned to the lender unpaid, lender may require that any and all subsequent payments due under the note and the security instrument be made in one of the following forms as selected by the lender. So if a payment is returned unpaid due to the instrument being invalid, right? Then the the uh, the lender can or it's a, or it's a signer uh, signee can um, demand payment in any form as selected by the mortgage lender. So let's say it's Bank of America or Wells Fargo whatever. 
you miss one payment or your instrument is invalid and returned or you didn't have enough funds in your checking account and the check was returned one time it means that they can select at their discretion to tell you that you must pay in cash money order certified check bank check treasurer's check or cashier's check provided that such check is drawn upon an institution where deposits are insured by a federal agency instrumentality or entity or electronic trans funds transfer I find it so interesting that people make all these claims and they buy into all these things being sold on the internet yet they don't even read their mortgage to see the <coughs> excuse me <laughs> they don't even read their mortgage to see or maybe they have read it and scrolled through it but they don't even know they don't even they haven't even remembered and memorized and understood and take taking note of that there are very specific methods of payment that are outlined in the contract in the mortgage now I'm sure that there's similar language but read you know whatever the document is on your mortgage read it maybe it says something different but if you don't read it how are you gonna go on the internet and claim that one process is a one-size-fit-all for everything and claiming that you can send you know Pokemon cards and baseball cards and other random stuff to try to offset your mortgage if the contract unless it's in the four corners there's something called the four corners rule okay you can't assert a right that's outside of the four corners of the document that you sign that's basic contract law okay unless you can prove that the contract is fraudulent or invalid in some way but <clears throat> nothing if nothing on the document says that you can pay in Pokemon cards and it specifically outlines methods that you can pay then you can't pay in Pokemon cards no judge will ever is going to agree with you and then it goes on to say payments are deemed received by the lender when received at the location destined on the note or at other such locations made designated by the letter in accordance with blah 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 okay so I'm not going to read all this we're going to close this out and get back to our uh, our notes here so as a practice companies offering accounts to homeowners consumers etc do not really participate in negotiating of Pokemon cards and baseball cards uh, nor anything that's outside of their ordinary now they specifically only signed the mortgage contract with you under certain terms that you would pay them under certain method and contrary to what some contract law gurus have said and sovereignty you know people on YouTube and so and so have said I've heard people say things like they just pick random stuff like out of the blue they have no basis for it and they just make outrageous claims like because of the US bankruptcy you can pay if, if you have a fine from a court restitution from a court traffic ticket a mortgage you have to pay credit card payment because of the US bankruptcy you can pay in coffee beans you can pay in Pokemon cards you can pay in barrels of rice you can pay in barrels of wheat you can pay in pairs of Wrangler jeans I've heard this in contract law workshops or, or you know a for V slash sovereignty common law workshops and nobody has ever cited a reference for it they just say it they just say that so-and-so got a fine from a court and he brought you know a wheelbarrow full of coffee beans and dropped it into the uh, you know you know like the glass window where you pay you know you pay your traffic ticket at court after you leave the courtroom and you go to the clerk's window and you write a check or something and you pay or you pay in cash or whatever I've heard someone say that they actually took a wheelbarrow full of coffee beans and paid their court fine in coffee beans I, I do not believe it and there's no reference to any law or any anything that allows people because of the US bankruptcy to pay in coffee beans or to pay in rice or to pay in you know kidney beans 
black beans, black eyed peas, frozen steaks, bottles of water. I, I just, just no reference for it at all. Yep, it's the shit people say. Okay, so more about why the promissory note process does not work. Back to the LPN, or the making your own promissory note process, among many other reasons. But we're just going to try to, we're not going to go on for like six or seven hours because, you know, we're going to try to keep it somewhat succinct. Those of you, you know, pausing along and writing notes and researching some of the things more in depth that I'm pulling up on the screen here and have been pulling on the screen. Um, can spend more time researching this like I have. I've, I've researched this for this one topic for dozens of hours over the course of time. Over the course of time, as this keeps coming up, <clears throat> I've dug, dug, dug and say, hey, I wonder if there's something to this. Um, or, you know, there's got to be some reason why this is wrong. You know, and, and my God, I just knew there was some, you know, I, I know it's wrong, but why is it wrong? And I know it's not working. Just because something's not working doesn't mean it might not be, there might not be a way, you know, maybe people are not doing it exactly the correct way. So, you know, I've done a lot of research trying to find, because obviously if, you, if we could find a way, if any of us can find a way to get this process to work where you just, you know, sign a document and you're not really promising to pay, but you're writing a document claiming that you're promising to pay and then you deliver it to them and then you can say, oh, gotcha, you accepted it. You didn't return it in three days. You didn't return it in 10 days. I have to cancel my, my mortgage and I have to cancel my credit cards. Obviously, if there's a way to do that with a simplistic, affordable process with one little, you know, template that everybody can create a little promissory note with a couple, you know, components on there and follow it, you know, we would all get out of paying all of our bills and uh, I guess the world would be a better place. I don't know. Maybe the world would be a worse place because nobody would go to work anymore and I wouldn't be able to go to my favorite deli and get lunch. I'd have to make all my food myself. I wouldn't, ha I wouldn't be able to go to the restaurants. I wouldn't be able to go to the deli. And I guess the farmers wouldn't have to make food themselves and work 14 hours a day on their farms either because they'd have all their bills paid for because they would figure this out too. Yes, I wouldn't be able to buy food from the grocery store. I guess nobody would work at the grocery store. I guess nobody would work at the electric company to even power the power lines to power the grocery store or my home because they would just use the promissory note to pass off to pay all their bills and they wouldn't have any debt and they wouldn't have any bills to pay. So I guess I would starve to death and have no electricity and no running water and no clothes because people who make the clothes, people who you know, control the the, the, the the public water supply, I guess. I have to collect all my own rainwater and grow all my own cotton and hemp and polyester and learn how to sew and get sewing machines. But how, how would I buy the sewing machines if the people that were supposed to go to work in, in wherever the sewing machines are made don't have to go to work anymore because they could just use a little promissory note to pay all their... Hmm. You see how this is like even if this did, if we could find a way to get this to work and everybody can use it and duplicate it, I, I'm not so sure that this would make the world a better place. I think it would make the world a worse place. I think it would make the world a worse place. No, I wouldn't be able to, I would, we would all die, we'd all go to civil war, we'd all be killing each other over a limited amount of resources. So, yeah, I'm not so sure it's, it even would make the world a better place, but <clears throat> I think it would make the world a worse place, but... Among other reasons why this doesn't work, according to contract law, the terms of the original loan contract, mortgage, the mortgage, unless it's a um, credit card or something, you know, not, not a mortgage, but the original loan contract, whatever kind it may be, details, details and specifies the parameters of the types of payments accepted to pay and eventually, uh, and, and, and the eventuality of a discharge or of the entire you know, once all of it's paid off, then the loan is discharged. There was a meeting of the minds. You knew what you were doing. And you voluntarily put down a payment, and then you continued to make monthly payments, further showing your awareness and intent to pay the balance through your actions and through your conduct. And as it reduced the principal, as it reduced, as it reduced, uh, as it reduced the the balance slightly over the course of time, month by month by month. 
this is a miswording. I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say. Um, oh, as, as the new statements are being sent to you with a slightly lower balance every month, you continue to pay according to the new assessed balance and the new assessed terms. I think that's what I was trying to say. Although, point B, although promissory notes by holder in due courses, meaning you purchased a note from somebody else of others' obligations, is an, ass is an asset as you are a new... You, it's been assigned to you, and you're the new holder in due course. You're you're the you're a debt collector, but you're actually the holder in due course, which is higher than a debt collector. So it's better to say you're the holder in due course for somebody for some for an original contract signed by people other than yourself, whom the holder in due course can now collect funds based upon the obligation and holder in due course laws. So again, this is you really gotta really dig deep and understand holder in due course, and it's in. UCC 3-302 is uh, the UCC section that you can look up. UCC 3-302. You're not going to read the whole Uniform Commercial Code Article 3. You might want to read the whole thing to put all that into context. Point C. Nothing in the loan contract that you sign says it will accept promissory note from you, a new promissory note from you, or from anyone else, but especially not from you. They're, they're going to keep the status and validity of the original promissory note. They're not going to accept a substituted promissory note. Nothing in the contract that I just pulled up before, nothing in the mortgage contract says, oh yeah, we'll accept a new promissory note with new terms and conditions that you just unilaterally send to us. It doesn't say that. Nothing in the loan contract says that the mortgage company will accept a promissory note from you or anyone else, but especially not from you, to pay a debt that's already been created with the original promissory note. Part D, a, promise, a promissory note by the same person is not a, quote, new promissory note. So here's the thing. You writing your own promissory note with the same bank, the same account numbers related to the same debt, is not a new promissory note because it is merely a derivative or sub subsidiary or recreation of the original obligation. This would be called a modification, if anything, or, or refinancing or modification, if anything, of the original loan. The only way to enforce this is to look at the original contract and see what modification amendment terms exist. And usually the bank writes itself as the power broker writing the new conditions of the terms. Okay, so if you if you read that mortgage contract and it does say in here, oh, you can just send to us anytime you want and a new promissory note with a new this and a new that and a new signature and you know we can reduce okay. If it says that then uh, then you're good. But it's it's you know it's it's gonna it's gonna bind you to certain terms. Read the mortgage contract. You can create a new date and a new count number on a new promissory note you want, all you want, but it is merely an attempt by you what it actually is. So form and substance. Write on a piece of paper if you've never heard this before. Form, F-O-R-M, and then put a vertical line through the page, and on the right side put substance. A judge or a lawyer or in, in law, in contract law, you always have to look at both the form and the substance. The form of this may be a promissory note that may possibly be valid, but if the substance is that it's really not, it's really just an, you know it's really just related to the same original contract and the sub, it's not substantive. It has if it has substantive you know loopholes, then. Um, it's kind of like you go on a dating website and you find like the most beautiful, uh, you know, other man or woman of your dreams, and if it's all your criteria, um, all the perfect things that you're attracted to, but the person is not real; it's just a robot. Okay, it may be the perfect girlfriend or future husband or whatever of your, you know, in form, right? Do you like tall people? Do you like short people? Do you like brown hair, black hair, blonde hair? Do you like different? You know, uh, you know, what, whatever you're into, right? Eye color, you know, you know, whatever. It can have all the right form, but it, it, it there's no substance to it if the person's just just like a Chinese like bot, 
if it's just like a robot <laughs> just trying to collect your email address and send you spam like so you got to look at the f the form and the substance a a a uh short but careful analysis of the form and substance of a note the person interpreting it can on its face tell and say i can I, I i'm not under any obligation to honor this because it's fictitious there's no substance to this or if the form isn't there form and substance have to be there in contract law so you can create a new date and an account number all you want but it is merely your attempt there's no substance behind it it's merely your attempt to modify the original obligation which would uh, collapse it back to the original contract which would mean that you would have to follow the parameters of the original mortgage contract you, you see to modify or consolidate the original obligation you are bound by the four corners rule so I said before you are governed by the terms of the original obligation for the terms and conditions of modifying or changing the terms four corners rule it's just it's something that people say it's something that's been you know judges attorneys have it's a way of describing if you have a contract and it's expressed in writing then anything because there are contracts that are not expressed in writing you can walk into a restaurant sit down order food on the menu and you have a contract that you have to pay the bill before you leave the restaurant but if there is a contract that is in writing anything not in writing is not part of the contract if that makes sense so if people sign a contract on, on a document then anything not in the document is not part of the contract that is the four corners rule in a nutshell both parties are governed by the terms of the original written contract for the term and, and must only refer to the written contract for the terms and conditions of on modifying or changing the terms there are some exceptions to that if it's fraud if there's something in there that's unconstitutional different things like that but we're not here in this presentation to go over all the exceptions but there is no exception that I found other than you know people stating the claim that because of the US bankruptcy you can you can send Pokemon cards you can send coffee beans and that's what people say but uh, I have not found that I, I, I have found no reference to that and I have not found that to be the case and obviously it's not working for people um, so we must reject the claim that you can pay your mortgage in coffee beans now if you here's an interesting thing even if there was some validity or there was full validity to the claim that, oh you could pay you could because of the bankruptcy you can pay a uh, traffic ticket or your mortgage or court fine in coffee beans or in barrels of wheat or in uh, diamonds or uh, gold and silver if if that was true it still wouldn't help you anyway because wouldn't you have to pay would, wouldn't you have to <laughs> if you had coffee beans that were not garbage coffee beans and old and stale and rancid if they were legitimate coffee beans and you got a hundred if let's say that you owed a hundred thousand dollars on your mortgage left if you took a hundred thousand dollars of coffee beans and delivered them to the mortgage company isn't that the same thing to to you as just writing a hundred thousand dollar check if you bring a hundred thousand dollars of silver that you've had saved up or lawfully acquired and you gave that to the mortgage company how does that benefit you rather than just writing them a check it's a push it's a push spending a hundred thousand dollars to get a hundred thousand dollars of of barrels of wheat or barrels of hemp or fresh clean water let's say you have a huge warehouse of bottled water worth a hundred thousand dollars of bottled water why go through all that effort that 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 warehouse full of bottles of water is worth a hundred thousand dollars then why do you care whether they would accept that or just paying them a hundred thousand dollars with a check it's a push you don't get ahead at all by buying a hundred thousand dollars of gold and then giving a hundred thousand dollars of gold to Bank of America or Citibank City Mortgage 
rather than giving them a check for $100,000. You don't benefit because it costed you $100,000 somehow, some way to get the $100,000 of value of, of bars of gold, didn't it? So unless, unless you're an alchemist, then you can just snap your fingers and create you know, gold. But if you could snap your fingers and cr spontaneously create gold, you could also sell that gold and then get U.S. dollars and then pay your mortgage in U.S. dollars. So I don't see any benefit, even if you're, even if you, even if you want to force them to accept your your document. Here's the whole point, ladies and gentlemen. If you want, if you want to force them because you think because of U.S. bankruptcy, you think that you can force them to accept any other asset worth the same amount, then you're losing an asset worth that amount. If I go and give up $100,000 worth of silver, I'm not any better off or worse off than if I were to write a check for $100,000. Because, I, I mean, if I, if I have $100,000 in the bank and $100,000 of silver, I'm going to give up half of what I own to pay the mortgage for $100,000 and still keep the other $100,000 for myself. Whether I give them the currency and keep the silver or whether I give them the silver and keep the currency, you're not better off. So there's no point in arguing about this. And there's no point in trying to do this. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah. Again, four corners rule. We went over that. Okay, so if you actually bought a few promissory notes, loan contracts, and or judgments, for the purposes, we're going to say notes. Any one of these, we're just going to summarize and say notes, documents, commercial paper, Okay, we should, should probably should say commercial paper. So if you buy a bunch of commercial paper, it's money. You're collecting monthly payments from, you know, you're collecting you're collecting debts from people, right? You own you you bought debt. You own debt. And one of the ways to do that is buy government savings bonds. You're buying government debt. So if you buy if you own debt through owning commercial paper, being the holder in due course, and become a bona fide holder in due course. And you got the attention of someone in upper management of the bank, then I'm sure if your notes really were valuable and has ongoing revenue streams coming in, then they're prof and they're profitable. Then you know, I'm in a in a theoretical world, the bank might let you barter with them. But again, they're just trying to run a business and say next in line, we're trying to service millions of customers here. And it's better that the bank services millions of customers, just like with ten dollar an hour employees processing, opening up envelopes. You know, passing checks on to the treasurer and having them be deposit, deposited or whoever they pass it on to, CFOs, you know, department, like manager. Like, don't you want the banks to service as many people as possible and provide mortgages to people who want mortgages to as many people as possible? If they were to spend time sitting down at the table with you and everyone else who wants to pay them in coffee beans or any, any other weird thing, they would not be able to service that many people and they would be spending 50 to 100 times more you know labor negotiating with you and making that decision whether they should uh, barter with you and accept your coffee beans or accept your silver bars or accept you know whatever and then they would not be able to provide small business loans to as many people who need them mortgages to as many people who need them and you know a lot more people would, would not be able to become homeowners they would have to rent from landlords and not have the benefit of owning uh, their own, uh, their owning their own homes, and having their own their own home. So I don't understand the logic. If you want this system to change the way that you think that the bank should barter with you and spend all this time getting important people to make tough decisions and negotiate with you to have you give up your asset where it's a push and you know no longer and you're no better off than than you were. And then now these banks are not able to help as many people and they're not able to service as many people. Um, I don't know how that makes the world a better place. I really don't. However, Fortune 500 Bank or any other large company or bureaucracy has a quite bit, has a bit of compartmentalization without having personal acquaintanceship with or a way to grab the sincere attention of a president or vice president. You would be disrupting the ease of flow and functioning of the assembly line of a company operating. Therefore, your argument will be ignored Due to procedure and compartmentalization, you will never get the bank's president's attention or sincere assent to your offer unless you sit down with them personally. You will be up to the courts 
oh, it would be up to the courts to present your merits. And as I will attach documentation of, the courts will commonly reject this argument that you know you offered something of equal value and the bank didn't accept it. They will commonly reject this argument as I've seen on many occasions. Although I did find one case of it working, I have observed others replicate or appearing to work. I have observed other many other cases replicating dozens of clients per year over the last several years of this procedure not working. So therefore, even if it does work one time, um, unless obviously unless you identify the massive loophole as to how it was able to work, um, but as I will cover further, what's the example of the one working? I, I believe that was one that I was actually unable to verify. So I, what it should say here is, although I may have found an allegation of one case working. Um, maybe I talk about that further as I keep going. Next, to dissect in more detail, this instrument we are using in the image above the little promissory note, which is a popular typical sample of what is being taught and used by some people trying this, appears to be a promissory note, but then its creator places certain features as that of a draft as well. Again, this really fits more into the category of draft and not a promissory note, and I'll explain why. Whereas a promissory note is not funds, credits, units being sent from any bank to another, and therefore does not include a drawee. So on the bank it says something about a drawee. Uh, I think it lists a drawee somewhere. Now this is just one example. There's many different examples, but if, if you put on here like drawee, drawer, okay, then... So I'm not. I'm not certain if I'm talking about that example, but without bringing up like all the five different, six different examples, so, some of those promissory notes. I'm not 100% sure that that it says drawee on here, so I don't want to say. I don't want to say the wrong thing. When I wrote this up, I'm sure. Let's see. Where does it say maker and location? Okay. Well, maybe it doesn't say drawee on here. But if it's there are examples like this floating around on the internet that say drawee and drawer. Okay. So if that's what you're using, it's not a promissory note. It's a draft. Okay, it's a draft slash money order. Um, when an instrument says one hundred thousand dollars, okay, here you go. It did. This instrument did say hundred thousand dollars certified funds remit at par via Fedwire. Okay, and then also has in the lower left corner has a Federal Reserve exemption number. Here you go. Hundred thousand dollars certified funds remit via Fedwire, U.S. Treasury exemption number. So that makes it a draft off of a alleged U.S. Treasury account via Fedwire. So that's very dangerous because if it's not, if there's no funds there, then it's fraudulent and you can get into some serious trouble. Whereas writing a, writing a promissory note can't really get you into any criminal trouble. You know, it, it, it's, it's just a promise. How can you be? Um, I, I've never seen anybody get into criminal trouble for writing a, a promissory note that the bank says is not is not valid. Um, but if you try to create a draft, tapping into some sort of a treasury certified funds, then we see people get into trouble for doing this all the time. So, listen, folks. Even if you disagree with me and you think that you know you have other arguments as to why this should work if you write certified funds and you write transmit remit via fed wire fed reserve account number exemption number routing number we've just seen people get in trouble for this so as far as practical and, and to be realistic um, I mean if you could prove that there are funds at the in that account and they're certified funds then I guess go for it, but you better be super careful if you don't want to get arrested and in trouble and facing criminal charges for, um, I, I mean, in this course, we're going to go over cases after cases after cases of people getting into trouble for these types of instruments. So this is this is the topic. See, see this, this, this failed process is the promissory note process. This is not the draft process. So on, on another one of these 
presentations, we're going to go over the people writing certified funds off of the U.S. Treasury and show you case after case after case after case of people getting sent to jail for that and being charged for that. So, moving on. So, if that instrument also says payable on demand, when a promissory note does not pay anyone at the time of a transfer. So, here, here's... <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> See, I know so much about UCC, negotiable instruments, contract law, that it's really just funny to me. Because the person who created this, they're having components of a promissory note, they're having components of a draft, they're having compo I mean, they're mixing like three different types of instruments together into one, and it's it's just so convoluted. You can't, how do you write a promissory note? Okay, look at, um, look at, like, when you look at the mortgage and you look at a promissory note that like like next to it, let's see if we can find a prom, you know, promissory note. It, it doesn't say payable on demand. It doesn't say payable like now. Okay, we're not we're not gonna go through the whole thing, but <laughs> go look on your promissory note. It does, it's not payable at the time of transfer. It merely promises to pay in the future. And now, just commit it, it commits to an obligation. I mean, some people may put a down payment. You know, people mortgage they they put a down payment, and they make monthly payments starting the starting the next month. But to to create an instrument that says one hundred thousand dollars, and then and it says and by calling it promissory note, and then claiming that immediately the person can get certified funds, that's like a, a draft or a money order or a check. That's not a promissory note. So this, whoever's creating this is, doesn't know, doesn't know whether they're creating a money order or a promissory note. Or they're call they're creating a draft money order and they're calling it a promissory note. Because a promissory note is paid over the course of time or at some future date. Payable on demand. Who who writes a promissory note to someone and says payable at any time on demand, including right now? Well, um, I mean it doesn't that. It doesn't really make any sense, it, right? If I give you fifty grand, and then you give me a promissory note that says payable on demand, uh, sixty thousand, right? I loan you fifty thousand dollars now, and I say I'm going to loan you fifty thousand dollars, but you're going to write up a promissory note, and you're going to give me the promissory note, and the promissory note is going to say that I can collect sixty thousand dollars from you on demand. Well, if we do that. I'm gonna give you fifty grand. You're gonna give me the promissory note. The promissory note says I can demand sixty grand from you at any time. So I'm immediately, upon taking possession of that promissory note, gonna say, "Okay, pay me back sixty grand. Pay me back my fifty before you go out and spend it, and then also pay me an extra ten grand." And in the same minute, I just made ten thousand dollars, and you did not get any use from from the loan because you paid it back five seconds later after I gave it to you. You see why you can't have a promissory note that says payball instantly on demand like at any time? It's in a time in the future. Just look at your regular mortgage promissory note. It's in the future over the course of time. I give you $50,000 and you make like $500 payments to me once a month over the course of time. And over the course of time, I might collect sixty, seventy, eighty thousand, hundred thousand dollars $100,000. That's what I get back for loaning you $50,000 is in the long run, hopefully... If you honor your agreement, hopefully I, I collect you know more than fifty thousand. So promissory notes are promises in the future, not immediate, not payable on demand. Um, they are future committing to an obligation. So the individual peddling this process is incorrectly labeling a draft as a promissory note and then selling the process to their customers as a little promissory note process when it is not really a promissory note. All the while telling them that they are paying their debts with promissory note and getting little successes, little to no successes or, or no successes, um, other than you know one alleged success that was unable to be verified and inspected. Looking anywhere, and I have further explanations as to why there may be some. Um, do I explain that in here? Yeah, I think, yeah, okay, further down in here, I do cover as to why, and I, I do believe and know that 
one or two of these alleged successes that were being um, purported I do explain further in this presentation the reason why. Uh, it's kind of like a magic magician's trick. It's kind of like trickery, like it appears like it's a success, but it's actually not a success because something else was happening. It was the reason why the mortgage got canceled. So I'll, I'll explain that in uh, further. So, but let me just let me just cover this now. So it appears like the author of this process, claiming that this works and selling it to people, I'm sure there's many people selling this to people. I'm not trying to single any one. Like there, this process is has dozens of people, you know teaching it, sharing it, some, you know, many, probably like half a dozen people selling it, okay? So it appears like the authors of the process are confused with promise, some of them are confused with the promissory note is and what a draft money order is in order to make a business for themselves, I guess, just throwing random stuff together with a tons of laws and codes cited on the instrument uh, in hopes of fooling someone or just praying that it will work in some way for them. So yeah, again, if you look on the one of the examples of one of these promissory notes by just throwing a whole bunch of laws and you know unit trial convention and on, on on international bulls of exchange and international promissory notes blah blah listen if your if your document is valid you don't need all these codes and notes all over it when you write a money order or check to someone it just has account routing numbers in the bottom it doesn't say all this junk on it it doesn't you don't have to use like hide behind all these laws to give validity to something that is not if the something's already valid on its face why do you need to like cite all the laws and all the code like you'll you'll never be able to cite all the laws and all the codes that connect to cause something to be invalid people someone should just look at it and automatically tell okay this appears valid and i think that by putting all these codes and everything on it it's really just someone's someone's insecure about whether the, the document has any validity because because it doesn't because they're trying to through stealth and through trickery, trying to get what they want, so they put all these codes and all these laws on it in hopes of giving more weight to a, um, a document that is uh, has no, you know really has no substance to it. So next on the on the instrument it says an obligation of the of the United States, 12 U.S.C. 411 and 18 U.S.C. 8. So let's make this clear: a promissory note does not have value and is negotiable to satisfy a prior and different debt if accepted oh excuse me <laughs> I, I read the wrong thing let me make this clear a promissory note does have value does have value and is negotiable to satisfy a different debt if the other party wishes to buy the note from you and use that to offset it but they, it's bilateral they have to agree to it because it's not the four corners of your mortgage contract that they will accept it without without their signature however the obligors, the one uh, that has an obligation, is forbidden to substitute himself or herself with their own promise unless expressly stated in the loan contract or modification signed by both parties. So, why involve the United States? You know, what is, what is substituting a promissory note? Even if I come to you with coffee beans, I come to you with a new promissory note, I come to you with bars of silver and I say, hey, can we substitute what this asset for my own, for the previous debt that I owe? What does the United States have to do with this? Why are you writing on the document an obligation of the United States according to 12 U.S.C. blah, blah, blah? What the hell does the United States have to do with anything? It's two private parties making a private negotiation. What the hell are you involving the United States for? Either the document you're signing is your promise to pay and has value based upon that, or it's the United States' promise to pay, like a Federal, like a federal Reserve note says it is, it's obviously the United States' promise to pay. Right, and everybody believes the full faith and credit of the United States government because it's the only government we have. It's existed for over two hundred years. So, when you try to pay people in the United States with a twenty dollar bill, hundred dollar bill, I mean, they're going to accept it, and they and they have to accept it because we all, you know, we all quote unquote, we all live under or within, you know, the United States government. I mean, we we don't, you know, there's there obviously there's common law and there's there's several union sovereign states, but just to keep simplicity. Or you're not in Mexico, you're not in Venezuela. If you were that one government, like federal government system that you're under, see, like, even in the sovereign union states, they all the states don't create their own coin and currency. They all seceded their power to the federal corporation called United States of America in Washington, D.C., to be the only place that creates 
coins, money, and we all use the same, you know, United States, federal, you know, U.S. dollars and Federal Reserve notes, right? So uh, because of that, anybody in the sovereign union states, according to the states seceding their, their authority to the United States, everybody has to accept Federal Reserve notes, right? So... You know, my point is though, if you're not using, if you're, if you're, if you're going to create your own promissory note, how is that an obligation of the United States? Either it's the United, the Federal, you know, twenty dollar Federal Reserve bill with a dead president on it in your pocket. Look at it. It's an obligation of the federal. It's an obligation of the United States. It says the the United States promises to pay the bearer twenty U.S. dollars. That's what it is. Whereas your promissory note is you promise to pay City Mortgage Inc. Hundred thousand dollars. They have nothing to do with each other. So, why put on your instrument that it's an obligation of the United States? And how is it an obligation of the United States? So let's read and see what they say. The promissory note instrument says, backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. Okay, so I'm talking about this. This on the bottom left. It says, uh, where does it say this? Uh, it says uh, on the top. I know it says it on here somewhere. It's really small. Here, this bottom left. This instrument is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. <laughs> I know you could say that if you don't work for the United States government, you don't have the authority to make that claim and put that on there. The instrument says backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government pursuant to. One note of caution here. How do you, a private citizen, have the right to say that the instrument that you created is backed by the U.S. government? If so, you must be consenting or admitting to being an authorized officer or director of the U.S. government with the authority to bind the U.S. government. Like, are you the Secretary of Treasury? Are you the President? Like, how can you how can you obligate? And even if you are, you have to be obligated by Congress in order to say that. In regards, you know, you, you can't. You're not just a tyrannic. Like, even if you were the Secretary of Treasury yourself, which you're not, or if you had authority from the Secretary of Treasury delegated to you, it all comes from Congress. So if Congress delegated to the Secretary of Treasury, who delegated, or to the Treasury of the United States, or to the President, who then delegated to you, that you can write on your own private instruments that it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, then I guess you can say that. But I really don't think that that happened here. I don't, I, that obviously did not happen. So where is your authorization? And do you see this is a very dangerous stretch that can get anybody into trouble? Let's look further into the authority cited to say that this is backed by the government. Because on this note, it says pursuant to 31 U.S.C. subsection 3123. So let's read 30, Title 31 of the United States Code, subsection 2123. Is that what it says? 2123, or is it say 3123? Let's, let's pull it up online. I'm probably going to have to pause this so I can pull it up. Okay, folks, on here, this is supposed to say 3123. They're not claiming uh, in this pro the, 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 the code written on here is 3123, and, and I did quote it correctly. So if you go to Google and type in uh, 31 USC 3223, you will see payments and obligations of interest on the national debt, Title 31, money and finance. So it's the United States Code related to money and finance and public debt. So if you click on stuff and read these things, okay, I have copied and pasted and quoted these sections here into this doc, the, the pertinent sections into this document. So instead of me taking more time and re-pulling it back up, but you can easily pull this up. So 31 U.S.C. subsection 3123 says, Faith of the United States government is pledged to pay in legal tender principal and interest on the obligations of the government issued under this chapter. Okay, it does not say here that a private citizen or a U.S. citizen's promissory notes are obligations of the government. Yet the purporter of this process claims that it says something that is absent here. All that this says is the faith of the United States government is pledged to pay legal tender, principal and interest on the obligations of the United States government issued under this chapter. So all that means is when the government takes out loans from the international banks, the United States government pledges to pay it back. That's basically what it says. Part B, the Secretary of Treasury shall pay interest due on accrued on the public debt. Okay, this is just what we're talking about. When the United States government goes into debt, 
takes out loans from the international banks, Secretary of Treasury shall pay interest due. As, Secretary, as the Secretary of Treasury considers expedient, the Secretary may pay in advance interest on the public debt by a period of not more than one year with or without a rebate of interest on the coupons. So regarding Section A and B in the context being listed adjacent to one another, and in fact, to get the full context, please read the entire third. So I'm, I'm encouraging you to read the entire the entire Title 31. I'm just not going to read the read it all on video here for the sake of time. You will see that Title 31 is all about the U.S. government authorizing and mandating the Secretary of Treasury to pay interest on the national debt, so that the U.S.'s credit rating stays good, so that it there's less compounding interest and it winds up owing less over time, and so it can function internationally in commerce with good credit with other governments and corporations. That's exactly what is meant when they say in this code on the obligations of government made on this chapter. It doesn't say that a private citizen or U.S. citizen can sign promissory notes and the U.S. government all of a sudden backs it by full faith and credit. It doesn't say that. So how does this apply to your personal promissory notes? Anyone graduating beyond first grade level of self-help law study studying no so no no matter how much of a beginner you are I mean I'm showing you what the code says and obviously it's being taken I don't even want to say it's being taken out of context I, I literally probably just think somebody just copied this code and put it on this promissory note and maybe hasn't even read it they're just copying what. I, 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 I literally don't know. I just don't know how you could be beyond a first grade level of any sort of reading about history, law, social studies, anything. Probably a second grader would, would, would be able to know that that this thing that we just read doesn't say that you can guarantee your personal promissory notes to pay your mortgage or anyone else by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. So anyone should be able to discern that the U.S. Code... Oh, okay, well, <laughs> here's another point. Anyone anyone who's, who, you know, any, everyone should know that the United States Code is not necessarily the law. So citing the United States Code is really just citing a watered-down version of the law actually passed by legislators or Congress that exists in the statutes at large, or the Code of... So the Code of Federal Regulations, the statutes at large, are the law. So for the nitty-gritty researcher like me, I want the truth and the whole truth. So don't you? If we were actually to read the actual laws as they are written and as they are passed and show me anything in them that says that a private citizen's promise to pay is an obligation of the U.S. and or that this usurps a private contract between the loan company and you, which it says you need to pay by check, money, order, or bank transfer, uh, then then in that case, maybe sure, you might, you might have this substance for something. So, you know, I don't know if that's over some people's heads, but... The United States Code has employees of Congress um, re-editing the actual law and making it and condensing it and making it simpler to read. That's the United States Code. So the United States Code is not the law. It's just a summary of what an editor condenses the actual the actual laws as they are written. The actual laws as they are written. For example, the statutes at large passed by Congress, Code of Federal Regulations, etc. The United States Code is not even a law, so it just it just goes to show, you know, I mean, you can cite the United States Code. I'm not saying that's totally half wrong, but in some instances, the United States Code is just a presumption of the law and has not been certified as the law. It's not been certified as positive law, and it even says that on the United States Code's website. Just go on Google, type in United States Code, Spend about 30 seconds on their website, look around and be observant, and it literally says on there, the United States Code is not the law. So, anywho, a lot of it is essentially, you know, a lot of it is the law, but not all of it is. So, you know, just, just FYI. In 12 U.S. Code, subsection 411, cite on the top of the purportance promissory note example above. Again, nothing in the code. Nothing in this code supports this promissory note in any way. So again, on this promissory note, it says 12 U.S.C. whatever, right here on the top. What it says, Federal Reserve notes to be issued at the discretion of the, in what it says in 12 U.S.C. 411, 
that Federal Reserve notes to be issued at the discretion of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System are authorized. Okay, so 12 U.S. Code 411 authorizes Federal Reserve notes. This is not a Federal Reserve note. <laughs> Let's compare. <laughs> Let's compare Federal Reserve note. I can't believe this is just like... I feel like I'm giving a presentation to kindergartners here, in, in a sense. Um, here is a Federal Reserve note, right? These are Federal Reserve notes. Why is this a Federal Reserve note? Because it says on the top left, Federal Reserve note. I'm sure if you're watching this, you've looked at you've looked at these things before. These dead president notes, Federal Reserve note. Okay, so. This is authorized under 12 U.S.C. 411. Whoops, I don't want to go to web. I want to go to... U.S. Code Subchapter... 12 Federal Reserve Notes. Okay, if you click on this, here you go. Federal Reserve Notes to be issued at the discretion of Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System are authorized. Are authorized. Okay. Okay, so why are you putting 12, why are you putting the code that says Federal Reserve Notes are authorized on your individual, personal, private citizen promissory note? You're not, <laughs> like, like, like what? <laughs> like, how is it related? Like, I, I just, it's just, it's crazy. The said notes shall be obligations of the United States and shall be receivable by all national and member banks and Federal Reserve banks. They shall be redeemable in lawful money on demand at the Treasury Department of the United States, the City of Washington, District of Columbia, or, or any Federal Reserve bank. And then they have, this was passed in December 23rd, 1913. Chapter 6, subsection 16, 36 statutes at large, 265, passed on January 30th, 1934. And it goes on and, and adds all the statutes that built upon this. And so you have to read like all these in order and in context to get the whole. Yeah, you know, that's that's the benefit of, you know, I'm not that's the benefit of the US code is that someone looks through all the laws because there's so many laws that crisscross and counteract each other. So when, when you look at that they shall be redeemable in lawful money on demand, that has been, that section has been basically nullified because it's been, you know, further laws related to this code have later on been, um, um, you know, um, you know, you know, added, right? So, you know, we are in a state of emergency. The Civil War has never ended all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, you know, lawful money on demand is not, is, not, is not currently, you know, valid. Although there was a congressional statute that passed this, that says this, it's, it's, not, it's not valid right now. So, we went over this again. However, the U.S. Code is not the law. You have to look at the actual bills passed through legislature and the entire history of all the amendments and modifications. And a whole bunch of them are listed right here. In order to get the whole story in context, an amendment in 1934 by an act of Congress on January 3rd, 1934, struck out from the last sentence the provision permitting redemption in lawful money gold. So there it is. I'm citing you and telling you exactly what you can look up. You know, this is one of my favorite websites. I've spent hours and hours and hours learning and studying and getting to the point I am from reading this Law Cornell School you know, when you type into a search engine and then you, the first result is always law.cornell, it's the best site that there is to study, in my opinion. So you just, you just read the laws and, you know, click and read things and you start to connect the dots and see through people's lies. I do understand, though, that for most, this is some heavy duty, nitty gritty digging. Maybe you need to pause it and reference and read all this stuff and then go back and watch it again. So, you know, of course, we are neck deep, naked together in a pile of mud consisting of contract law gibberish, according to some people. This, all this stuff might be going over somebody's head. I hope at least half the people it's not going over your head. The bottom line here is that what does it, all this mean to you? 
if you understand my points or you don't, who cares? Let's see if this promissory note substitution resentment process, or sometimes called <coughs> the little promissory note process, works or not. Let's see if it works or not. Proof it doesn't work the way it's being taught, prepared, or used, at least. I have to disclaim, you know, I have to disclaim myself. Maybe somebody will find some way that some derivative of this process does work. And, you know, I don't want to be caught on video saying uh, that there's no way for any. I just haven't found one yet in over 10 years of doing this. And I've been studying this intently and deeply and getting hundreds of people every single year share with me their failed you know processes that they're doing so you know again I don't know what I don't know and I haven't seen what I haven't seen and I haven't seen probably hundreds of things that people are doing but I have seen hundreds of things that people are doing you probably don't have a website that has dozens of people email you a day and call you a day and, sh and share the things that they're doing I do so I am incredibly grateful for that. I mean, I, I, I have, because of that, I put all my time into studying and finding and dissecting and digging and cross-referencing and seeing what remedies are successful or if there's something that we can improve upon and try to make better. However, the way that this promissory note process is in probably no way in any shape or form will ever be modified but I can't be 100% guarantee on that because you know only time will tell but proof that this process the way that it's being shared sold taught teach etc on the internet um, is is not working I will you know whether you understand all this and understand how to read the, the law or you re if you read if you read this and it doesn't make any sense you don't understand what it means. I think it's pretty clear it's pretty English for the reserve notes issued at the discretion of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System are authorized. The notes are to pay the government's debt. I mean, it's pretty simple what that code says. It really has, it's pretty simple to understand that has nothing to do with your own private promissory note or giving authority to your own promissory note or saying that the government, the federal government is going to back your own private promissory note. I mean, it does, if that's over your head, folks, I, I don't know what to say, but even if it is, here you go, here's some proof that this process uh, doesn't work a restraining order is the easiest order to get in a court you're not getting a judgment after trial you're not getting a uh, final judgment you're not getting a summary judgment you're not getting a um, declaratory judgment a restraining order has a less of a burden of proof than a okay a, a criminal conviction judgment after trial has a, a high burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It doesn't say 100% guarantee this person is convicted of the crime. There's no doubt in your mind that they didn't commit the crime. A criminal conviction at trial is beyond a reasonable doubt, but that is really high. In civil, a civil judgment is beyond a preponderance of the evidence, 51%. So it's more than likely that the plaintiff convinced beyond 51% of doubt that they're right and the defendant then the defense is wrong. Now, a restraining order you only need like a five percent proof that you're right you only need like one to five percent one to ten percent proof you could still in the end wind up with all the facts and everything being hashed out later on at some determining you know trial of adjudication you can still be proven to be wrong and be overturned but a restraining order is the easiest all you have to prove is uh, I, I'm in fear of my life from my uh, ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend and you go and you automatically get a restraining order. It's it's just a, it's automatic approval process. It's okay. We're gonna put a temp okay temporary restraining order is like is like one percent. All you gotta show is one percent of anything to get a temporary restraining order. To get a full blown restraining order, maybe five ten percent. But to get a temporary restraining order, it's don't you understand, folks? Temporary restraining order. You go to the court as long as you sound believable and you have one piece of evidence that supports anything that you're saying. You say, hey, my boyfriend sent me text messages threatening my life. Boom, temporary restraining order, granted. It doesn't mean, you know, it, you don't have to prove that he was serious or that he wasn't serious. All you have to prove is that you claim that you're in fear for your life. Who's to say or that you are, like, losing sleep at night or you, you know, now you feel like uh, you have to lock all your doors and put special alarm systems and you have a three-year-old kid. You got into, people get, into, boyfriends, girlfriends, they get into fights all the, husband, wife, 
people get into fights all the time. And they say things in the heat of the moment that they don't really mean. And every judge knows that. But if you go into court and say, "Hey, so and so said said that," you know, they don't even have to say that they're that they uh, that they were going to kill you or strangle you. You just need to show that they got aggressive, that they said one aggressive adjective in one text message, and boom, you've got a temporary restraining order. Every judge in the country should give you a temporary restraining order if you go into court, you filled out all the forms, you sign an affidavit saying, "I feel that uh, I feel." anxious if this person were to come within you know in, into contact with me on purpose so the judge is going to sign a temporary restraining order saying you know you're forbidden to come within half a month you know you know where miss smith lives don't go to her house don't go here don't go to her children's school don't go whatever it's the easiest thing to get it requires the lowest burden of proof why because you're not sentencing someone to prison for the rest of their life you're not sentencing someone to give up all their assets you're not sentencing someone to, you know, uh, pay child support for the rest of their life. You're not sentencing someone to sell their house and give up half of their house, like in a divorce. Uh, you're not sentencing someone to the electric chair. All you're sentencing someone is to stay away from somebody else who doesn't want anything to do with you. So, it's the and and who who's who's going to deny someone say hey, I don't want anything to do with this person for the time being until we like figure out and come to some sort of an understanding with each other right i don't want I, I don't want this person in my physical presence shouldn't shouldn't you respect that right if if your ex boyfriend girlfriend says i don't want anything to do with you please don't call me and contact me ever again shouldn't you honor that and not not telephone them not write them letters not knock on their front door not randomly spontaneously show up like in the grocery store like like bumping into them and okay stay the f away from them it's the easiest thing a temporary restraining order okay if you have any degree of any any five percent validity one percent validity of what you have possibly being able to win so a lot of people try to file temporary restraining orders on um to stop the foreclosure and stop the sale of their house so let's read this this is a u.s district court district of, of oregon case and one of the cases we were following Notice of electronic filing. This was entered on. Well, let's see if we could zoom in a little bit for you guys. We already are zoomed in. Following transaction was entered on so and so 2017 at so and so date. Filed on so and so. So obviously, I'm trying to pr protect the person's uh, identity. Case number. Let's just call him or her Smith. Smith versus Satiris Inc., which is a mortgage serv very popular mortgage servicer. Case number, blah, 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 CV, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Docket text. Order. Plaintiff's emergency motion. Plaintiff being the Smith homeowner. Emergency motion for a temporary restraining order is denied. Plaintiff seeks to stop a foreclosure scheduled for tomorrow. Plaintiff apparently admits to defaulting on the note secured by the deed of trust. Plaintiff argues instead that she is no longer in default because she sent the debt collector a new promissory note with a warning that if you do not return the note, then we are in agreement that the account has been paid in full. Apparently, because the defendant did not return the note, because Satiris Inc. did not return the note, plaintiff, the homeowner, argues that she is no longer in default. Plaintiff does not attach the note or the deed of trust. Generally, those documents contain the terms agreed to by both parties, just like I explained before, explaining how one cures a default. The court is unaware of any deed of so the court saying you didn't include the note or the deed of trust but we are familiar with deeds of trust and the court is unaware of any deed of trust or mortgage allowing a debtor to cancel an obligation of over half a million dollars that's the amount they owed on the mortgage or the deed of trust by unilaterally drafting and presenting a new promissory note with a condition that if the creditor does not respond in three business days, the debt will be forgiven. The court is unaware of any deed of trust allowing a debtor to cancel an obligation of over half a million dollars by unilaterally drafting and presenting a new promissory note with the condition that if the creditor does not respond in three business days, that the debt will be forgiven. Because plaintiff has not demonstrated any likelihood of success on the merits of their claim. Remember I said all you need is 5%, all you need is 
ten, you know, any possible likelihood of any success on the merits of your claim. Because the plaintiff has not demonstrated any likelihood of success on the merits of her claim, her request for temporary restraining order is denied. It's finished down here. Is denied. Ordered by Judge Michael so and so. All right. So I've never seen anybody win in court and finalize uh, and win. You know, to get a full judgment. And I've also seen these temporary restraining orders get denied, which is still just you know has a much lower burden of proof. All you have to do is show some likelihood of possibility of success and people are still losing so you know this is what we do here we follow cases we dig up cases we show proof we try to find successes so that um, well <laughs> like I said before uh, the world maybe the world will be a better place if everybody can get all their mortgages eliminated but also maybe the world will be a worse place I don't know I'm not fully attached to it but uh, you know what we do here bottom line is you know, we research people's claims, whoops, and we uh, we don't just take people's word for things. Is there hope? Are they onto something? I'm going. I'm not going to spend any more time here in this article citing the same things that I see here that are possibly on the right track with this process. So that so this is you know again, maybe you know some of the arguments or have heard some of the arguments for this. That's not what I'm going to spend time on because. This is kind of a critical presentation pointing out the things that are wrong because all you got to do is show that one element of what they're doing is wrong and that, you know, makes moot the entire process, makes, the, you know, exposes the entire process as being invalid. So due to the interest of time, we, uh, you know, maybe in a future, pre maybe as you learn in presentations and cross-reference all the codes and everything, you know, things will become self-evident to you what is correct, um, you know, People make all sorts of claims, like your signature creates the money and all this stuff. Your your signature does not create does not create money. A valid note with all the form and substance bells and whistles on it does create commercial paper that is an asset. If the promise is valid, it done in good faith, is bona fide promise that is followed through with the actions of the um, note issuer. That does create money. That does create an asset. Your signature does not create money. Your signature does not create an asset because if it's a fake promise, and or if it has, if it if it's a mole, if it's a mix, if it's a this is like a mutated child. You ever see on South Park where one of the sometimes they like <laughs> they really screw around on that show with your with your mind, but they have like a like an aborted like fetus like growing out of someone's face on South Park. Okay, that's what this is. This is a mutated like half of a draft money order and half of a promissory note with a whole, which a whole bunch of U.S. code stuff on it that talks about how Federal Reserve notes are authorized to be issued by the Secretary of Treasury. It has nothing to do with anything about what you're doing. So, I mean, it's just like a mutated aborted fetus. That's basically what this is. So, um, what I will summarize here So I'm not, not going to go over what would make a promissory note valid and what would make a draft money order valid. I'm, I'm, again, I kind of just summarize it. The form and the substance and the validity of the promise and the intent of both parties. And all the components, the dollar amount, payment terms, um, borrower and lender being clearly issued with their name, you know, official legal name and address. Um, you know, if you put a borrower and a, and a lender names on here and they were not real companies or not real people or not real persons then the note would be invalid like if you looked up city mortgage inc and there was no such company then that alone would invalidate the whole promissory note does that make sense if you put um let's see uh, if there's no date on here that alone would invalidate the promissory note so you know there are some things on here that i can say the person did right they put a date on it they put a real valid company they signed their name as the issuer and as the um, the lender, and they're saying that Citibank Mortgage is is the is is either the uh, payee or the borrower. So, you know that you're putting a dollar amount on here. You're writing it out in uh, one hundred thousand United States dollars, and you're writing out the number. 
So, you know, there are some things that they did correct, but there's a lot of stuff that makes this whole note basically a uh, freak child of, uh, you know, a Martian mating with a horse and coming out with an aborted pile of garbage. <laughs> so, you know, again, done correctly, maybe there is a loophole with a promissory note process that one day somebody can find and will perfect. In the meantime, the courts and the judges will probably ignore you even if you, e okay, even hypothetically, I, I wrote this up a long time ago. I probably wouldn't put, put all this in here to confuse everybody, but even if you created a correct process and you are correct, the, the lower level judges are still probably going to rule against you unless you go to the appellate or Supreme Court levels. Uh, it, it, they're going to make it difficult for you. So just warning that if you, you know, a lot of people are just very beginners and so, you know, when I was a beginner too, I was naive. It's, I'm not trying to insult anybody. You know, when we're beginner and any, when I'm a, you know, if I'm not an expert mechanic, right, I may be naive when it comes to, um, you know, certain things uh, under the hood of, of, of a car, right? I may, I may not understand it. So if you're beginner or naive about this and you have, you're, and your mindset is, well, if this is correct, every judge should, you know, acknowledge it or every lawyer or every every bank when they get this should open up and see oh, okay it's valid here we go uh, we're gonna acknowledge it you know just just to warn you that s some of these you know you're going up against you're trying to get your half a million dollar mortgage eliminated right so even if there is some technicality in some process just a warning that it might be necessary to go above to the appellate level in order to rule against a judge who ruled incorrectly that is also a very strong probability so just warning that if you have a, if you do not have in store for yourself to engage in such a larger project and, and go it out for possibly years in the making to try to win your half a million dollar mortgage to be released or canceled, um, just make sure that you're in it for the long haul. Because, and, and I know a lot of people, you guys are, but 80%, 90% of the people do this process or might pay for this process. Um, and they're not in it for the long haul, and they just they're just trying to they're trying to see does it work? Possibly this can work. I have my hopes up. It's like a lottery ticket mentality. That's what I found is eighty percent of the people have a lottery ticket mentality, and they do this process, and they're not willing to appeal it all the way to the Supreme Court. If they really think that it's right, then that's what they should do, and they should they should win, and they should have it win, and be able to prove with that Supreme Court case or that appellate court case so that they can. Prove to everybody that it works. Uh, and if you are going to modify what I've taught here to try this process and you insist that uh, this process does have standing and does have validity but has some, you know, incorrect things that were done in the, uh, uh, that you could fix, then, you know, I, I, I applaud you. Go ahead and make your promissory note substitution process more correct and more, ac and more accurate. And you better make sure you actually cite precisely what you are doing and not random citations of the U.S. Code that have nothing to do with your private promissory note, which is what you're actually doing. And don't you know mix and match a money order and a promissory note and put some components of one and some components of the other into this, like, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't mate um, an alien from Pluto and, uh, and a horse from planet Earth together and try to create something that no one's ever seen before. So... Now I'm going to address the random one or two successes that are floating around on the internet and why they were not real successes, in my opinion. What about my, what about, you know, client X or my friend X, you know, John or whoever, I saw them discharge their mortgage or loan with this process. In many cases, people have sworn to me that they saw this process work, this promissory note process work, or have had a loan canceled or discharged. What we found upon investigation, careful discerning investigation was that those one or two isolated cases were due to the following anyone that's been around you know mortgages and foreclosure stuff should know that uh, long enough should know this but most people aren't, haven't been around it long enough but what you should know this what you if you talk to an attorney uh, um, that you know deals with closings and mortgages and things like this for you know, ten years of their life, they will probably all understand this. Banks can and routinely do cancel secondary loans, often periodically on their own accord, especially 
secondary or non-priority mortgages like home equity lines of credit it's very common for a secondary mortgage or even credit cards that they deem uncollectible after several years it's very common that banks will cancel loans on on their own now look at this this promissory this was this note that's been passed around and purported that it was successful was for only for one hundred thousand dollars majority of the people that are trying to cancel their mortgage and stop their foreclosures are in the three hundred thousand dollar five hundred thousand dollar if you saw her in this example with the temporary restraining order she's tr the 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 plaintiff is suing for a temporary restraining order trying to cancel her half a million dollar obligation okay so it's very suspect when you see someone passing around an example saying that it was successful for only one hundred thousand dollars this is probably a secondary mortgage the non the pri not the priority mortgage this is probably a home equity line of credit which which is a second mortgage okay the banks do this for tax write-offs when they cancel it's very likely that this was going to happen with or without you doing your promissory note process anyway just coincidentally over the span of time the bank saw that you're not paying the first mortgage you're probably you're not paying the second mortgage and you defaulted and you're being foreclosed upon by the first mortgage company so the second mortgage company says hmm let's get a tax write-off and let's cancel this mortgage because we're never going to get paid voluntarily by this homeowner anyway so they wind up making money by canceling your debt did you know that if you didn't know that then I guess this is news to you but to me I already knew that for many years it's obvious in fact the banks will cancel your debts if they're second in line for a tax write-off it's very likely that this was going to happen whether you did anything or not um, and especially if you fell behind on you, you know your mortgage both your mortgages your first and second mortgage it's very likely that over the course of a year two years three years later they may just cancel your mortgage because they will wind up paying less in taxes this calendar year and get a tax credit so that's why a lot of times they do this at the end of the year and they'll send you the notice sometime in December because at the end of the year the annual accounting period which usually resets on January 1st for most companies but not all companies some companies can set their accounting year to end you know April 30th uh, you know May 31st but they don't they can do it anytime they want they just register with the IRS on their SS4 form that their end of their closing of their account year is uh, their accounting year is you know February 8th or August 15th they can close their account year any any year they want but a lot of companies do it January 1st to December 31st so that's why you see a lot of them being canceled on December 30th December 29th you know they will cancel a few days before the end of the year but also they can they can happen at any time I'm just saying it's very common to have your debts canceled within the last few days of the calendar year um, including you know some people have had that happen for credit cards myself included in many years in the past so you know as you could as you you know or just private debt collection companies they may send you they're, they're canceling your debt they found the debt to be uncollectible and they want a tax credit and they will make money by canceling your debt because they will earn a tax credit so since you've shown since you've shown the banks through your papers that you've sent that your goal is to not pay them obviously it's safer for this secondary mortgage company who has no interest in your home because the first mortgage company has the rights to foreclose and sell your house and collect all the money for it not the second mortgage company generally speaking so it's safer and more beneficial and profitable for them to cancel your debt so that they will wind up paying less taxes due to a tax credit and just move on without you and forget about you so just be that happens so just because you got lucky doesn't mean that you should encourage other people to do this process because you sent this process and it happened to appear like it worked for you and you really don't know what's going on that the company was going to cancel your secondary mortgage anyway just does not mean that you know what you're doing and it doesn't mean that other people are going to get the intended result due to a random coincidental ano ano anomaly um, 
which in my opinion was was you know had, it was coincidence that after you sent this note maybe three months later six months later nine months later 12 months later they wanted to voluntarily canceling the debt on their own for a tax credit it, has, it doesn't mean that your instrument uh, was successful and it's unethical to be telling other people that it was successful do you, do you agree okay closing on here other times an individual may reply using this or other positions in court and seem to stop the sale or eviction of their house etc so that's what I'm saying you know there are people who, who get a temporary success and maybe they will get a restraining order or maybe they will uh, temporarily stop the sale you know people people file bankruptcy that that's another process uh, bank you know people can people can do things and stay in their home longer than they ever expected and think that they're winning but there that doesn't mean that this promissory note wins and doesn't mean that in the end they will win with this techn with this species of technology so although this does not mean the courts are going to agree with you on winning when the fat lady sen sings at the very end so i'm, I'm not going to call something a temporary success or a delay of but you could send anything to the bank and it caused them to send you back a letter that says we're going to need 90 days to read everything that you're doing to give to to, to validate whether or not you know uh you know we agree with the documents you sent us right that's not a success that's just a delay and the whole time while you're delaying for them to figure out what's going on your interest is comp it, it, your, your your balance you owe on your mortgage or your loan is comp is increasing due to compounding interest the principal plus the interest of is compounding and growing exponentially and compounding so at the end of the day you're gonna wind up owing more money if you wind up losing the reason why you can have success, some successes temporarily with trying almost anything and hold on to your home much longer without paying any mortgage payments is, well, because of due process. We all know what due process is, right? It's like if you get arrested and you bail out of jail and six months have gone by, 12 months have gone by, 18 months have gone by, two years, three years have gone by, and you're not sent to prison yet, and you're not convicted yet. It's just due process. Every due process. What's due process? Whether it's civil, criminal, foreclosure. Um, due process deals with the administration of justice. Due process is the legal requirement and that, that you need to be respected for all the rights that you have. You need to be, you know, proven beyond a reasonable doubt. You need to be um, all the legal pr process needs to be carried out, carried out with the regular and in, in accordance with established rules. You know, you can't just kick someone out of their house because you think that you have the right to do so. You need to go through a all the motions that lead to being able to conclude with that, right? So that's that's due process. So, you know, due process is on your side. You can try anything and say, oh, I've been in my house for two years and I haven't been kicked out yet. So, you know, it doesn't mean what you're doing is what will work or is successful. It's oftentimes due merely to due process. Dear, due process is on your side. It's on the side of the, um, you know, you're, you're presumed innocent until proven guilty, right? In, in, in a criminal sense, but you're presumed that you can hang on to your home until it's proven beyond a reason you know beyond a preponderance of doubt and through due process and through court and all that stuff um that uh that that they have the right to foreclose right you have to be proven wrong in court in many states before you get kicked out so even a process doomed to fail is still help help is still helpful to save some depending on the state two to three years on uh delaying of your owing on your mortgage payments. It doesn't mean you're getting out of paying two or three years because obviously the uh, compounding balance keeps increasing. But that's totally fine if that's disclosed to you and that's what you plan for before engaging in the process. I mean, that's totally fine if you're aware of it. The reason why it lands on this ineffective list is because we are listing processes that work, that wind up working in the end, majority of the time, all the time, versus the ones that the courts categorically do not agree with because they don't have the law on their side. They're, you're not using the laws to um, successfully do anything, so the court's not going to agree with you. 
So also, if, there, if your process will not produce a sleep sound at night and never get reversed, total and irrevocable win, then we're not going to put you on our win list, and then therefore we're going to put you in this failed processes list. What we know does work usually without going to court. Contrary to the promissory note process, discharging your debt through the Treasury fiduciary appointment as an authorized and totally com completed secure party creditor, in our experience, is working terrifically and effectively right now and can be replicated quite nicely. So I didn't feel it was right to make this whole presentation and not at least give you some sort of a hint to talk with us or, or to, to, to re you know, research and look into processes that do work. Because what's, what's the point of going over all these processes that don't work? At first, do no harm and educate people so that they're not wasting years and years of their life and, and, and the limited money and funds that they have going in the wrong direction, of course. But also, we want to give you um, some uh, things to remember that do work so that you can come around full circle. And when you're ready, you can review and look into the processes that do work. So if you're interested in the secure party creditor process, please contact Understand Contract Law and you win. And uh, also, I'm not saying that the that that the discharging debt on all different types of debt is effectively working right now either. I'm just giving you one little hint of what does work. I'm not saying it works on mortgages or it doesn't work on mortgages. All you'd have to contact our company and, and find out. That's not the the point of this presentation right now. What I know is this process does work and is working repeatedly for certain kinds of debts. I'm not going to go into right now which ones and which ones don't and it changes over time, has changed over time and there's a lot of factors um, that have to be reviewed. It's not a blanket for all, uh, you know, that all these types of debts will work and all these types won't. Sometimes it's um, a series of questions about your account and what state you're in and how many times the account's been sold and different things like that need to be assessed in order to give a total um, assurance that um, we believe it's a thumbs up that it would be successful. So, um, contrary to how particular we are, uh, there are other people selling the promissory note process that are saying it works 100% of the time. We'll take any client. This works for all mortgages, all car loans, all, all student loans, all phone bills, all hospital bills, all everything. So. You know, if you want to find out who's telling the truth, look at how particular someone is and how detailed someone is with whether they say something's going to work or not going to work. You know, if someone just says, oh, come on right in, this works for everybody in all situations, um, it, it's a little suspect. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it's not 100% proof that the person's lying, but um, just, you know, take that into consideration. That's the way I would think. If I was a, from knowing what I know now, if I was a potential customer, I would kind of be. A little suspect if someone says, "Oh, yeah, this will work 100% of the time. Yeah, just pay me five thousand dollars and it'll work 100% of the time for whatever you know, whatever, whatever. Electric bill, phone bill, medical bill, mortgage, card loan, student loan, credit cards, all the same process, the same paperwork. It works 100% of the time. You know. So there are some instances where we have seen moderate relief and our pressure. Okay, so you know, here's the thing: no matter what you're doing, even if you're doing this promise or not process that I've criticized. Hopefully you do it in a way that you don't put like U.S. codes and you don't say that it's a full faith and credit of the U.S. government without their authority to say that. But let's say you do some variation of this process and it winds up, you know, causing the attorneys to review everything and have to, you know, have to deal with how are they going to combat you and have to deal with putting specific um, foreclosure complaints against you and blah, blah, blah. You know, doing anything can give you some pressure fighting back against the bank for closing on you or, or trying to collect money from you and can be able to bring them to the negotiation table. It is also, although rare, possible and has occurred that you may get one isolated judge or CFO of a bank that may um, agree with you or rule in your favor usually. Okay, so I do I do believe there were years ago... Um, colleague of mine was sharing with me that the CFO of a major bank was on his way, was on his way out into retirement and decided to take some of these instruments that people were sending and discharge people's debts and he discharged a couple dozen people's debts on his way the last few days in his office on his way before retiring. I do believe that that was true that that 
did happen. <clears throat> and then you can uh, <laughs> you can verify it later to see if that bank that bank CFO, chief financial officer, did leave the bank. So um, you know, people in the positions of power, CFO of the bank, can who got your instruments in the mail, you delivered directly to them. I mean, they can, even whether your process is valid or not valid or is a gray area, it's up to them to make a decision whether or not it's um, valid or not and whether to process it in your favor or against your favor. So certainly you can get a disgruntled employee here or there uh, and get lucky. So, but because those instances are so rare and cannot be duplicated over the long term and cannot and was were isolated incidents, they cannot be duplicated. And that is why we are making this generalized conclusion in conclusion to say that the promissory note substitution process or the little promissory note process does not work. So, um, you know, trying anything, hopefully something that doesn't get you into trouble, can obviously provide pressure. If you show the debt collector foreclosing bank, whatever, that you're willing to put up a fight, obviously if you use negotiation, if you have a good negotiator in between you or if you are the negotiator or you have some sort of a negotiating well credible lawyer that is negotiating, it is very possible to use the wrong processes to get the right result. You can negotiate and try to get the bank to forgive your interest payments and get back on a um, mortgage agreement that you can agree to. I would say if you were able to renegotiate, cancel the interest, cancel the last few years of not paying, and reaffirm and do a modification agreement and re-sign mortgage modification, basically you're re-contracting with them that you're going to go back and basically sign a new mortgage that's going to amend and be substituted in replacement for the old mortgage terms and conditions. And if they were to, say if you owed the $500,000, if you agreed to pay only $425,000 and they wiped, that's called a principal reduction. If they wiped off $75,000 off of the principal and you restarted paying starting right now, and, and, and a monthly basis and you make payments before the first of the month to pay down the 425000 you just save $75,000 and you didn't have to move and leave your house. I mean, that's that can be negotiated even using the wrong processes. So just throwing that out there. Um, and I think that's, ba that's, that's basically it. You know, feel free to cross-reference... Um, you know the codes that we talked about in here and see that 31 United States uh, you know you know United States code see what it actually says um, you know do your own research so just trying to uh, just trying to dive into the nitty-gritty here because the nitty-gritty does does matter okay thanks for watching please watch the the next failed process in this series, which I believe is the accessing your Treasury Direct account by using your Social Security number as an account number and the Federal Reserve Bank routing number to pay your bills with those two items. So we'll go over why that process is incorrect in the next video. All right, folks, in this ineffective procedure presentation number two, I'm going to uh, go over some uh, research I've done on the accessing your TDA or Treasury Direct account, i.e. use of your own Social Security number as your account number and use of the Federal Reserve Bank routing number to pay your bills. Um, if you have been online in 2017 and 2018 at all, you and you go to YouTube and type in TDA or Treasury Direct accounts or you know, Federal Reserve, pay bills with her TDA, pay bills with, you know, pay your bills with your, uh, uh, you know, hidden TDA account. I mean, whatever, whatever it is you type in to, to search, there's been a lot of stuff. Um, if you look on, um, a lot of the publicity has been surrounding this Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe and Randall Keith Bean um, court case. Now, 
um, people <coughs> have been a lot of people had been following them. Um, this was a long time ago, but I think they wound up using their account, their social security numbers and Federal Reserve routing numbers matched up to pay bills and purchase things. And I think this uh, Randall Bean purchased a car or something like that or purchased a, a certificate of deposit accounts. And, and then they came after him and they charged them both with, uh, um, you know, a combination of crimes and they were both convicted. So um, the, the, the last of my... Um, Following them, they were arrested, they were charged with crimes, and they were convicted. And what happened throughout 2017 and 2018 was people were following these uh, cases, and uh, a lot of people were saying, uh, don't do anything yet with your TDA accounts until we see how it winds up, because if, if Heather and Randall Bean uh, wind up winning their case and finding that they were allowed to use these numbers to purchase things, then... You know, it'll open the door, and we can all use it, and and not have to worry about being arrested because they were uh, they were found not guilty, or they were acquitted and found by the court that they were allowed to, or they were found in front of a jury or whatever that they were that they did have the authority to do this. So, um, anyways, it's been a debate on YouTube, and lots of people have been uh, you know making their own you know making their own videos and and talking about it. Everyone from you know everybody and their mother, as well as uh, anonymous. Saying, uh, you know, talk, giving their opinion on, on TDA accounts and so on and so forth. So, anyways, this is just what I have to say about it. Um, you know, here was, here was one of the videos. Uh, update for the reserve. I wonder if this video is still there. Okay, my YouTube is not really... Uh, is really working. We'll try to find that video. Anyway, I, I took a screenshot of this one YouTube video. It was 10 minutes long, and, you know, it just kind of shows how kind of silly it is, you know. Update, Federal Reserve routing numbers. They got a bunch of people put their hands in the air like they're at a concert or something like that. Is this video still there? Okay. Uh, my internet connection just got knocked down. So, you know, it's... <laughs> I mean, it's 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 an update of what's going on with the FRB routing numbers. None of these videos, none of these people, none of these companies have a process that works that uh, you know is successful. Many people were, and a lot of people called my company uh, throughout 2017 and said that they w did use their Social Security number and their Federal Reserve Bank routing number to pay. Uh, you know, an online bill payment, and they were saying, oh, this worked, and this worked, and every single time, it got reversed. But people think that because it worked initially, that there must have been something to it, you know, so that kind of kept them digging further down the rabbit hole. Um, and, um, you know, here's what I have to say about this. So, going around in YouTube at the, mo uh, at the time I wrote this, summer 2017, but will be short-lived. We get two to three calls every day from someone telling us that they have done this, but within a few days they discover that it almost always gets reversed. If not in a few days, it gets reversed You know, within 10 days later. After a few weeks after that, it will certainly get reversed if not done, if not reversed immediately. You can use any random set of account numbers with a real routing number, and it sometimes will appear to be accepted or submitted, and then you will later on get, or you will get a notification that your payment is pending until the system realizes that the account doesn't exist or that you're not authorized to use it. Um, okay, let me explain this. If you use a real routing number and a random set of numbers as an account number, um, maybe that account number is somebody else's account number. The routing number is real. The account number is real. So it's pending. However, when they find out that the account number is not your account number, they reverse it or the pending does not uh, go through to conclusion. Does that make sense? You put a valid account number and a valid, valid, valid routing number, it comes up pending or comes up that it goes through. And then when they see that the that, that the name, the names do not, let, let's say you even just made up an account number. You went to your online bill pay for your credit card or your car insurance or your auto loan or your mortgage and you just put in, oh, I'm going to do an online e-check, right? And you put in some random account number. 
probably someone's account number because that bank has millions of customers. So if you just type in any random set of eight digits, probably gonna be someone's or nine digits, or it's probably gonna be someone's account number by coincidence. So it is gonna go through as paid, and then when they find out that that account number is under you know Joe Smith, and your name is not Joe Smith, your name is Tim Jones, the names don't match, so it's not authorized, so it kicks back. Okay, so that's what would happen if you put in some random account number. Now, I'm not saying people are doing that. I'm saying in this process people have been talking about, people are using their social security number as the account number or the numbers on the back of their social security number as the account number. And the letter, the first letter on the back of your social security number is a uh, A through L for the Reserve Bank. So people, you know, say, oh, there must be some secret account here. And they match up the, uh, if, um, up for you. Oh, here you go. Here's the video. Update for reserve bank routing numbers. Oh, yeah. Come on, everybody. <laughs> everybody jump on board. Go to the concert. Let's have a party, you know? That's like the image of this. It's it's like pulling people in like, oh, this is this, there's no danger to this. Let's just throw our hands in the air and have a party. That's kind of like, you know? So, let me just show you. Uh, let's see. So, Back of social security card. Yeah, so the secret British bank control number. So on the back of your social security card, there is a letter, A through L, and there is a series of numbers. And this is connected to something. But the purpose of this video is not to go over what it is. The purpose of these presentations is to go over what it what it is not initially. And we can have conversations later about what it is and how to do it. But right now we just want to prevent people from doing harm to themselves first and foremost. Because if we can prevent you from doing harm to yourself first and foremost, then you can stay out of jail and you can stay out of jail long enough to learn how to do things correctly or what things are to you know, what things are are myth that have not been accomplished and then you can spend your time uh, getting prepared for doing endeavors that people have accomplished if that makes sense so people were looking up okay let's see so this person's Federal Reserve Bank branch is C right federal okay, reserve notes let's click on images you look on the one dollar bills you see the letter A through L here F the corresponding letter telling you what um, Federal Reserve Bank these notes were printed out of F and if you look read around the F here it says Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta Georgia it's really hard to read, but it does say Atlanta, Georgia. If you look on this one, that's for C. It says Fair Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So basically what, what they're saying is these are all, see, like some of the best lies are 90% true. And some of the best lies, people don't even know that they're spreading lies. So, you know, I'm not going to call people liars because, you know, that that um, then you have to prove that the person intended on, putting up false information but people are just kind of like steering the wrong direction and they know there's something up here's the thing people know something's up and so they jump and they try to do things and get themselves into trouble and that's what's been going on so you know this C means that yes your social security account is connected through the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia Pennsylvania and you've got um, Ooh, these letter these 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 letters here are a corresponding account. Um, obviously, there's an account related to your Social Security because by having a Social Security card and paying into the Social Security system, when you retire and you're over 65, you can apply for Social Security, and then you will get money out of the Social Security account to live off of when you retire, right? So. Just because there's a Social Security account and there's account number associated with it doesn't mean that there's a hidden secret government account that you have the right to that you can access before your retirement age. That's a big jump. That's a big jump to say, oh, I'm 25 years old. I can use this account number to pay bills. It's not for you yet. 
It's for you after you retire, and if you fill out the application to become eligible for Social Security, if you've paid into it enough over the course of your life. That, that's, that's, the, that's the basis. So if you call the Social Security Administration and get them on the phone to admit that this is an account, they're not, it, it's not some secret, like, crazy thing you have to brag about over YouTube. Like, yeah, there is a Social Security account for everybody. Like, of course, like, everybody in Congress and everybody on politicians on TV all talk about it all the time. So what's, what's the big deal, right? So now, there are public, public Social Security accounts and there are private Social Security accounts. So it, it goes beyond that, but just for a beginner, if you happen to call Social Security Administration or you happen to look at this and see, and find that it is an account, it doesn't mean that it's an account that you're authorized to use, it doesn't mean that it's an account that's open, it doesn't mean that there's billions of dollars that you are able to access to buy stuff. Hold your thought process right there. Maybe it's for you when you retire. Just like if you have a mother or father or grand grandparents that collect Social Security, obviously there's a Social Security account. Right? Obviously. So, <laughs> I mean... Uh, just because there's a bank and account number doesn't mean that uh, you should just go buying things when you're before 65, before retirement age. So let's let's uh, see what I wrote here. Uh, go over this. Yeah, so this kind of explains how you can put uh, a real routing number and random account number and either get lucky. You can even put your social security account number and uh, get uh, a pending transaction because it is a real account number. So if a real account number comes up in their system and a real routing number comes up, it will go through, but it doesn't mean that there's active funds in there. It doesn't mean that you have the authority to use it. Uh, it is a Social Security trust fund. There's a public and a private, and the numbers that you're tapping into, the pay bills, are all on the public side. So basically, you're, you're tapping into your public account number for when you retire and you're old, and if you paid into Social Security over your life and you can tap into the public Social Security trust fund, well, um, it, it, it's going to get kicked back because someone is going to see that and it's going to be kicked back and reversed. So you know, the bottom line is, why would you want to do something that's going to get reversed and isn't going to work? I don't know. And possibly get you in trouble. People are getting into trouble for, the, for this too as well. Um, others are posting online that they're using the Federal Reserve funds to pay themselves or buying certificates of deposit, etc., and out of this money they're buying the homes, cars, and then subsequently getting arrested and going to jail. Hmm. The bottom line, folks, is that the Federal Reserve Bank... Okay, so... Okay, so now here's the thing, too. <clears throat> the... Um, when, when people make these purchases, it's coming up, or when people make these pending purchases that get reversed, right, or the, the, they're not really purchases if they're pending... And they get reversed. They're, uh, they're, they're when they're. Let's see. What do you want to call it? When, when people tr attempt these transactions, they come up. Federal Reserve Bank. I wish I could show you. Um, I do have a screenshot somewhere. Client sent me. I have to dig it up and get it and add it. I'll add it into the file if 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 you get this whole package and you get this whole um, this whole product. I will add an example in the file because unfortunately I can't pull it up on the screen on the video because it's it's somewhere in someone else's email address I believe but I will show you that what it looks like and it actually will say um, Federal Reserve Bank of uh, what does it say there's something on your receipt that shows or writes out that the account the that account number and everything like who it, it reads part of the name, right, of who, uh, what what account it is. So it's kind of like, you know, when you, you know when you make a purchase and then you go to the receipt page or you look on your online banking or whatever and it says, uh, or, or you, look, you look on the receipt page, right, and it says, um, you know, XXX, blah, 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 you know, Chase, blah, 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 and it has a bunch of account numbers and says something. You know, it'll say what bank it came from basically, right? So there's something that says, you know, uh, Federal Reserve, Trust Fund, blah, 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 right? I'll show you the image later on. 
But let me explain something. The Federal Reserve Bank is the central bank for all banks, right? Right? You, you got to get the three ahead. You got to get the three ahead. Um, here, let's go. What is the Federal Reserve Federal Reserve Bank is a regional bank of the Federal Reserve System, the central banking system of the United States. There are 12 in total, one for each of the 12 Federal Reserve districts, that's the A through L letters, that were created by the Federal Reserve Act in 1913. The banks are jointly responsible for implementing the monetary policy set forth by the Federal Market Committee and are divided as follows. So anyways, in the first sentence, the Federal Reserve Bank or the Federal Reserve System, the whole is our regional banks, so there's 12 of them, part of the Federal Reserve System, which is the central banking system of the United States. So in pure English, in a nutshell, the Federal Reserve is not, you as an individual can't just go to the Federal Reserve and open up a bank account. Federal Reserve regional banks are banks for all of the banks. So the Wells Fargo's and the Bank of America's and all these banks, they their bank is the Federal Reserve Bank. Does that make sense? That's where they, that's their, you know, that's, that's, when you, when you go and get your money out of your checking account at your bank, well, the, that bank, Chase, Bank of America, etc., they get all their money from the Federal Reserve. That's their bank. i to type in Federal Reserve Bank or Bank. Go to their website. About the Fed. Here you have the Federal Reserve Bank regions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Richmond, Land, Chicago, St. Louis, Minneapolis, Kansas City, Dallas, San Francisco. I don't know why I'm going online trying to prove to people that the Federal Reserve Bank is a central bank for banks. I mean, that's that is what it is. Unless you have proof that you are a bank and you have entered into the Federal Reserve Bank system as a licensed bank, then you cannot access Federal Reserve Bank funds. You don't have the authority to do so. So what is correct and what is not correct? Yes, your Federal Reserve Bank access does. So when you go and use your numbers on the back of your Social Security card and your corresponding routing letter, yes. The Federal Reserve Bank accesses funds via your Social Security number. Yes, through the A through L letter on the back of your card. It does represent Federal Reserve Bank region that your all caps birth name estate is held. However, let me explain how it works more fully than a, a lot of these 25-year-old people on YouTube who have just discovered the straw man within the last year. And they've just discovered that the U.S. is a corporation within the last 30 days. And what they say versus someone who's been studying this for 10 years. Okay, that is not everybody, but there are some, like, <laughs> I remember when I would go online and type in TDA accounts back in 2017, I mean, I would see, like, there would be people who literally claim that they just discovered that the U.S. is a corporation within the last few weeks, and they're literally trying to pay bills with this. Like, I've been saying this for 10 years, and I'm not, and these people just discovered it and are. I mean, it's, 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 it's very dangerous that people just jump right into things. Um, I'm sure I'm not singling anyone out. I'm not saying that someone that literally has been studying this for 10 years has been studying it for 30 days because I'm not going to lie about somebody. I'm just saying there are some individuals who are promoting or promoting this TDA and telling people, yeah, get on the, get on the bandwagon and let's all have a concert, throw our hands up in the air. 
a lot of people making these types of videos that are uh, literally just like, you know, like popping open champagne bottles and feeding them to like their two-year-old selves. Like, okay, it could be dangerous. You could die of alcohol poisoning. Like, just relax. A bank such as Wells Fargo Bank of America needs a debt obligation from a customer, like a loan or promissory note obligation. Then they register that with the Federal Reserve Bank and the DTC. This allows them to access your asset credit based off the collateral of your birth certificate, representing your commercial energy, labor, mortgaged or monetized, similar to mortgaging a home or property, to create credit out of, similar to how you can mortgage your home or property, to create credit out of the equity of your house. So this is kind of how money is created off of mortgaging assets. If you study modern money mechanics or talk to any other banker, you'll see that the way the banks work is that an asset must be the assets must equal the liabilities by bank closing time. So, you sign a $10,000 debt instrument. The bank accesses $10,000 in asset credit mortgaged off of you as evidenced by the DTC registered birth certificate. Therefore, the bank gives you a loan for $10,000. So you see, there is a there is a process and a procedure, and the books need the, the accounting books need to balance the debts and the assets to equal to cancel each other out and equal zero. That's called balancing the books. What you guys are attempting to do here, the TDA uh, overzealous people, is based upon unbalanced book entry policies, and that is why it is being reversed every time. What you guys are proposing is unsustainable and cannot be allowed even for a few people because then it needs to be allowed for everyone. And when you and they all get reviewed and reversed, and when you share it with other, when you share it with others. Once everybody starts accessing FRB funds on unbalanced book system and becomes a millionaire or billionaire overnight, you okay? So let's just say this does work, right? And everybody gets to access unlimited billions of dollars of Federal Reserve Bank funds, even though you're not a bank and you're 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 tapping into the Federal Reserve Bank, and it's. It's not lawful. <laughs> anyway, let's just say that you did and you could, and you become a millionaire and a billionaire overnight and pay all your bills with everything, and you buy you buy stocks, and then you sell the stocks, and you cash out, and you start to accumulate billions of dollars in your bank account, or you buy homes, and you sell them, and you become a billionaire. Okay. Once you quit your job and your time becomes more valuable, you no longer okay with trading an hour of your life for $20 an hour, $30 an hour, or even $100 an hour. You demand... One hundred thousand dollars for an hour of your labor or your person or whatever you know. You're, if you're selling a T-shirt, if you're selling a pair of shoes, if you're selling a television, you're not going to sell it for. You're not going to sell a used flat-screen TV for four hundred dollars. You're going to sell it for a hundred thousand or a million dollars, because m when money is so much easier for you to come by, and you and your debts, you don't have to pay them through trading your time. You can just tap into your unlimited Federal Reserve Bank funds. Well, you know, since you already have a hundred million or a hundred billion dollars in your bank account. You need more people to convince you of doing things for them. You need you need more more money for your time, right? If you have a billion dollars, and I ask you for this favor, or I ask you to, you, you're going to want more money for your time. You're not going to work at McDonald's for ten dollars an hour anymore if if you did. Or let's say you make a hundred dollars an hour, which is a decent. Let's say your time you run a business and your time is worth a hundred dollars an hour. You're going to demand more. You're going to demand thousands of dollars per hour to do anything for anyone, because. It's not worth your time anymore. If you have a hundred million dollars, why are you going to do something for an hour of your time for someone for only a hundred dollars? It's not worth it to you. You'd rather you have limited time before you have your last breath and you wind up dying. So you say my time is super valuable. I want to do whatever the heck, whatever the heck I want. But you know, maybe I can use an extra ten million dollars if you if you want an hour of my time. It's worth ten million dollars. So as everyone starts to do this, everyone increases the value of what their time is worth. And then when you have your billion dollars in your bank account, you're going to have to pay $100 million from to anybody to get them, to bribe them enough to get them to do anything for you. So when you go to the restaurant, you're going to pay a million dollars a meal. When you fill up your car with gas, you're going to pay half a million dollars to fill your tank up. Everything is going to increase because everyone is going to get unlimited millions and billions of dollars. And it, and it winds up not like helping your financial situation anyway. Temporarily, it does because if you tap into becoming a billionaire before other people do, but if this is going to work for you and you're going to find a way that it works for everyone and you're going to expose on the internet how it can work for ev and everyone, eventually then in a few years, everybody's going to copy and do it and, and no one's going to be in a better situation. It's not a charitable thing to figure this out and expose it and have everybody do it because everybody's going to raise the prices for everything 
and then you might be a billionaire, but being a billionaire is only going to be equal to being a thousandaire. You see? As thousands do this every day, and we all become instant millionaires once you reach the threshold of, okay, yeah, once, like, even a percentage of, once, like, 1% of people do this, then, like, within a few weeks, like, you're going to have every 3 and then 5%, and then 8%, and then eventually 100% of people are going to figure this out and share this with every all their family and everybody they know. Because if you have 5% of people doing this, <clears throat> then you have the haves, the, the people figured it out, people have not figured it out. And if I've figured it out, and I'm doing relatively well, and I have my family that have to pay $1,000 you know, for groceries rather than $100 for groceries because everyone's raising the prices, well, then I'm going to have to go to my family and I'm going to have to go to everybody else and explain to them how to catch up with what the 5% of people are doing and then eventually everybody's going to do it because I'm not going to allow, like, my grandparents and everybody to, like, you know, they have a limited life savings and retirement accounts. I'm not going to allow them to pay, like, $10,000 for, like, a Hanes t-shirt you know, I'm going to have to say, hey, man, you know, all the prices of T-shirts have gone to $10,000. The prices of getting a microwavable dinner meal have gone up to $20, $25,000. Shit, I better go help my grandparents out. I better go help my nieces and nephews and my cousins out and tell them, hey, the reason why prices of things are starting to go up places is because everybody's time is worth more because everybody's a billion. 5% of the people in America are now billionaires, so I need to teach you how to become a billionaire. This is how you access your federal reserve funds and do what everybody else is doing. So you see, like once once certain percentage of people do it, everybody's gonna have to tell everyone else how to do it. Otherwise, the people that you love in your life are gonna be falling behind and eventually go, you know, bankrupt and be homeless in the streets because the prices of things are gonna go up so much that they're gonna have to spend all their life savings to pay for all the stuff just to like get by in a, in a day, get by in a week, and pay their normal bills, which have gone up in price dramatically. So don't you see that, and, and then everybody's wages will start to go up. Eventually, your millions of dollars will be worth less because it will cost you $10,000 to buy an egg sandwich at your local deli, $50,000 to fill up your car gas. Basic common sense supply and demand economics. So I guess people that are going online trying to share, oh, we got you know, this TDA account, oh, it's the greatest thing in the world. I guess people don't understand basic economics 101. I guess you were not paying attention in high school. You're not paying attention in your college course on economics, and you don't understand that this is not a good thing. If, if it starts to take, and that, that's why the people in, in, in the background that are stopping and reversing these transactions, I mean, they're doing a good thing. They're stopping these transactions to prevent society from changing too quickly, too fast, and having, like, real economic difficulty with people homeless in the street. You know, once you have a certain percentage of people that can't get by, you, you, you immediately will create a lot of crime. You'll create so much of a crime, exponential crime wave you, you, you can't just the, the state can't just instantly like hire 10 times as many police and then 50 times as many police to counteract all the crime of how, fa how fast the crime will explode so if you want to live in a dangerous society where people you know 95% of people can't get by so they're breaking into the rich people's homes to try to you know rob you know raid their refrigerators and and trying to survive and take their clothes and stuff I mean if you want to live in a crazy you know, society where we go and spiral out of control into chaos. I guess that's what you want. But what I want is a stable society and a stable economic system with a stable monetary system. So when you, when you still have people tapping into these, and you know, and even the people who say like, oh, you know, you can create money out of thin air with your signature and all this stuff. Well, if you want to do that and you want to just create money out of thin air, that's basically doing what the Federal Reserve is doing, where they print money out of thin air and pump it into circulation and reduce the value of everybody's savings and create an inflationary runaway monetary system that's un unsustainable and hurts everybody over the course of time when more money is pumped into circulation and you have money saved up or assets or property saved up it becomes worth less because there's more money to go around so people eventually slowly but eventually start charging more money for things that's why the price of things go up over time that's why 10, 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago the price of things costed less. And it's going to keep doing that when you keep pumping more money into circulation. So even if you believe that there is a private account and you can tap into this private account, create money, and you know deposit your own promissory notes into your own bank and become a billionaire overnight and just have all this money, well, then that's creating the same thing that you're saying, you don't, you know, the, the majority of the like, libertarian 
people against the Federal Reserve. You're against it because it's creating inflation that's hurting your purchasing power and hurting your life savings and causing the cost of things to have to go up more over time. So if you're going to tap into some of these theories that are floating around out there and have a, a become a billionaire overnight and tell other people to do it too as well, all you're doing is causing hyperinflation. It's not making the world a better place at all. So I hate to burst your bubble. Some of these purported processes do not look like anyone has gotten an A in economics course on supply and demand, although I forgot most of what I learned in economics class myself, at least, I do, at least I did get a, a decent grade, at least I passed the course, and at least I understand and remember the concept of supply and demand. Don't you? Which begs the question, so many people say, oh wow, all the, all the TDA YouTube supporters have been saying, it's only a matter of time before they, or Trump, allows us to access our TDA accounts. This is what people have been claiming. Hasn't happened yet. You know, I should have done this video way back in 2017, but I probably would have gotten a lot more hate if I did at that time from all the hope. You know, people are hopeful and they're hanging on and they hate they're working in a factory for $10 an hour. And so they get really emotional and passionate about wanting to become a millionaire and a billionaire overnight and pay all their bills without working and earning money for it and then paying bills normally. So, you know, uh, you know I hate to burst people's bubbles, but it's been now it's at the end of 2018 almost and still this TDA account stuff fizzled out and didn't get anywhere and um, you know it's not going anywhere and uh, the Heather and so and so got convicted and you know it's just basically every transaction got reversed people were really excited about it for a little while hmm again if it did happen and we were all able to access and create either to instantly create some people believe you can instantly create money through your own signature some people believe that there are government accounts with billions of dollars in it that um, we can learn how to tap into either either no they both can't they, you know I guess they can't people have different theories so they don't people don't necessarily believe in both of them but if that did happen and you were able to access infinite money hundred million dollars hundred billion dollars tomorrow wouldn't supply and demand just adjust the prices for everyday goods, items, and people's labor to make everything exactly exactly the, still the same as it is right now? What sort of Kool-Aid are people drinking? The other problems presented. By attempting to access your Federal Reserve Bank account instead of making efforts to discharge or terminate or revoke your birth certificate being monetized for fraud and then collapsing the entire birth certificate legal name trust and to, to, to go back to when you're existing only as a common law citizen. So this is basically a secured party creditor process. This is, this is what we do is we discharge and terminate and revoke your birth certificate and the, um, um, the uh, contractual uh, implied trust contractual exchange that that creates from it. Due to fraud, due to non-full disclosure, you were an infant, you were a baby, you couldn't consent to mortgaging and securitizing your life, right, and your future labor. You couldn't consent to that, so we, we discharge it, we accept it for value, discharge it for fraud, put it into our private trust, and we collapse the entire implied trust contract that created your name into a state organization subsidiary, and therefore its property being owned by the government, and we take you out of their surety ship and make, put you back into common law, right? So that's, that's how you regain your sovereignty. So the problem is if you decide to access your Federal Reserve Bank account and perpetuate the existence that you were mortgaged and you work, if you believe that there is this multi-billion dollar, dollar account, then you then what you're doing is you're consenting to, you're believing and consenting to and tapping into an account, which means that you consent to its existence rather than collapsing it and discharging it. So if you, if you, if you want to access the Federal Reserve billion dollar account on the private side, that was created through the mortgaging of your life, future labor, future property, future assets, then all you're doing is perpetuating the existence that you were collateral, monetized for, for the federal government to get credit from the banks. Monetize, monetizing and mortgaging your future labor and your property and your future children and your enslavement to the corporate United States de facto government system. So is that what you really want? It's a big question. Is that, is that what you really want? Do you want your sovereignty? So that you're 
sovereign and free, and the government cannot take your kids, cannot take your money, cannot take your property, cannot tax 35% of all the money you make. If you want to regain that and regain your sovereignty where you own the fruits of your own labor, you own your own children, you own your own body, you own your own life, you own your own home, do you want to regain sovereignty or do you want to say, uh, okay, what they did in 1933, what they did at my birth with the birth certificates is perfectly okay, and I just want to tap into the money to, to buy things. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have both. You cannot have both. Because one of them contradicts and mandates that the other one is fraudulent and invalid. By using your account routing numbers to do anything within the United States and taking funds not authorized to you on a Federal Reserve Bank account, you are crossing behind the arm's length into their jurisdiction. If you uh, and crossing beyond the minimums slash minimums contacts and into their jurisdiction. If you stay a private citizen in common law, your status and standing and position or claim for your sovereignty can stand if you stay in common law. But to the extent that a sovereign starts commercial transactions beyond minimum contacts inside or within another country, government, or corporation, it loses, it therefore going to commerce, you lose your sovereign immunity to the extent of those commercial transactions. So even if you were a sovereign, you waive your immunity for every bank transaction dealing with U.S. banks, such as the Federal Reserve Bank, quote, what you believe is a, quote, secret bank account that you're trying to access. So you, you, you're, you're removing your status as a sovereign. I shouldn't stay here to the extent of the commercial transaction. I just overall at all, if you go beyond minimum contacts, you're no longer a sovereign. Obviously, the system is going minimum contacts. Basically, what that means is if you get one piece of mail every like five years that that uh, doesn't have the zip code removed or zip code out of brackets or has a two-letter state abbreviation putting you to the federal, uh, you know, emergency war, martial law that's never been, you know, we've never declared peace after the Civil War and we're still in a state of emergency and so the federal corporation has invaded all the sovereign states and still has these like you know it's like Hitler when, when like you know Hitler invaded po you know neighboring countries France and Poland or whatever they set up military zip code zones and that's their territory that they have jurisdiction over until the war is over and the war is declared peace and then and then those zones don't e exist anymore it's like when the US invades Iraq like you know it breaks it up and it claims to have jurisdiction because we're in a war. And each little section is divided into like these little uh, occupation enclaves, right? So if you start entering into that military jurisdiction contract of that invaded occupied territory military army, you're consenting to its jurisdiction. You're consenting to the war powers. You're consenting to it. So if, like for example... If you, every so often, like once every five years, you get like one piece of mail or you do one thing like wrong or you fill out one like, you know, renewing of a driver's license every 10 years, like, okay, if everything else you do keeps you out of their jurisdiction and in common law and not taking any benefits from the government, you know, you, unreg you unregister yourself to vote, you unregister yourself from being eligible for unemployment, jury duty, you know, paying taxes, everything, and if you, you know, and you have one, like, one little thing that you do, then that is, that can be considered that you only had minimum contacts. If you have beyond minimum contacts, through it basically creating a habit or a routine of accepting uh, the, that jurisdiction, then you lose your sovereign immunity. Go to Google, type in uh, minimum contacts. Minimum contacts is a term used in the United States law of civil procedure to determine when it is appropriate for a court in one state to assert personal jurisdiction. It's not subject matter jurisdiction, it's personal jurisdiction over a defendant from another state. So if your other state that you're from is the nation of Ohio or the nation of Pennsylvania, the sovereign common law nation, and you're trying to prevent the United States from asserting jurisdiction over you because you, you're, def you're a defendant from another state and you're saying you're sovereign, I'm not a U.S. citizen, 
just because you're not a U.S. citizen doesn't mean that the United States government can't get jurisdiction over you. They don't have jurisdiction over you if you're uh, a citizen from another nation or another state, like in the com common law state of Ohio, and you had less than minimum contact. So let's continue to read. The United States Supreme Court has decided a number of cases that have established and redefined the principle that it is unfair for a court to assert jurisdiction over a party unless the party's contacts with the state in which that court sits are such that the party could reasonably expect to be hauled into court in that state. The jurisdiction must not offend traditional notions of fair play and substantial justice. So if you go into a state and, and open up a business there and start doing a lot of business there, you can reasonably expect that you be hauled into court in that state and that that state has personal jurisdiction over you. But if you stay away and you don't enter into... So anytime you deal with like the banking system, that's the United States. So anytime you deal with the Federal Reserve System, that's the United States. So if you, obviously, if you do anything related to the Federal Reserve and start accepting and tapping into Federal Reserve accounts, obviously you can it, it can be understood that through your actions you can reasonably expect to be hauled into court and the court have personal jurisdiction over you. Let's read Merriam-Webster. Minimum contacts. The level of a non-resident defendant's connection with or activity in a state that is sufficient under due process to support the assertion of personal jurisdiction under the long arm statute. Okay, that's another key term there. Long arm statute. So what is the long arm statute? Long-arm jurisdiction is the ability of local courts to exercise jurisdiction over a foreigner, foreign meaning outside of the jurisdiction, whether a state, province, or nation, defendant, whether on a statutory basis or through a court's inherent jurisdiction, depending on the jurisdiction, this jurisdiction. So, I mean, like, if you do anything with the Federal Reserve, tapping into Federal Reserve accounts, the court has inherent jurisdiction over, you know, the United States... District Court has inherent jurisdiction over anything related to you stealing from the Federal Reserve Bank, right? <laughs> like, duh. This jurisdiction permits a court to hear a case against the defendant and enter a binding judgment against the defendant residing out of the jurisdiction concerned. So you got to understand these things just because you're a non-resident alien, just because you're not a U.S. citizen, if, if that's what you're claiming your status is, doesn't mean that you can't be hauled in and that they can have jurisdiction over you. You still have to be not, like... You know, not um, crossing over into their jurisdiction and doing certain things that break their codes, rules, regulations, and laws. At heart, the constraints of long-arm jurisdiction are concepts of international law and the principle that one country ought not to exercise state power over the territory of another unless some recognized exception applies. So, you know, I'm just running over this really quick, but, you you know, there's International Shoe versus State of Washington. I mean, there's all sorts of, Kate, like, study.com. I mean, well, it's, how do I learn so much about all this? I just type it into the Internet and read. Wow, cool little uh, video. International Shoe Co. versus State of Washington. Long if a corporation is located in one state, does business in another state, and employs people in yet another state, they just may fall under the long-arm statute. This sounds confusing, but it really boils down to this. Long-arm statute allows a state to exercise jurisdiction over out-of-state defendants, provided that the government can prove that the defendant has at least minimum contacts in form state. This means if a corporation was to be sued in a state which they do not actually do business in, but have a connection to the state, say, by employing people within that state, and the employees receive regular compensation for their work, the corporation is considered to have minimum contact sufficient enough to be sued within the forum state. Just what makes for minimum contact? Minimum contact rule establishes that so long as a corporation had a degree of contact within the state bringing suit, they are subject to the laws of the state and can be sued. Okay, I'm not going to play the whole thing. Go to the website. Check it out. Cool little website I just discovered right now. Look, they have all sorts of general versus specific jurisdiction, jurisdiction over property, subject matter jurisdiction, 
transferred intent for assault and battery. Okay, really cool, like, law courses here. Study.com. Uh, check it out. So, um, so yeah, so if anyone is interested in remaining a sovereign and not going to jail or being sued by um, the United States uh, and having uh, general jurisdiction over you, then I would stay away from, you know, some of the things that uh, are, you know, if you, if you if you take from some government trust account, doesn't that make you subject to their jurisdiction? Especially if the trust account on the private side that people talk about was created by mortgaging the name and, 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 and reaffirming that the birth certificate had... Uh, you know, mortgaging the collateral of your life, labor, and property through the birth certificate has authority. And if you did and they mortgaged your life, labor, and property, then that event in and of itself gives them jurisdiction because you are a creature of the state. Everything you do is a is under the state's umbrella because they gave authority to that state, all caps name, in order to create a mortgage off of it, in order to create the credits to fund the corporation and to, uh, you know, you know, uh, be in the Federal Reserve private trust account that you claim exists. So, can't have your cake and eat it too. Obviously, this system is going is going to do an assessment on the transaction, not matching the practices and the booking procedures, and soon reverse it. So, what's the point? Again, what's the point of doing all this if it's a, if it's just a protest vote? You can do that in many other ways. You can create solutions in your community to help others. You could run for office if you would like to participate in the democracy and change the system, or you can just protect your assets privately, grow, collect your own food. If you are having trouble making money and accumulating money, then learn how to collect rainwater, learn how to collect food, learn, learn how to build your own house with supplies that are affordable and cheap. Learn where you can go to buy land for really cheap. Or start your own business, become an entrepreneur, spread, spread in spread information spread health information to people and, and wake people up as to how chemotherapy and vaccines are poisonous if that's what you believe in do whatever it is that you want to do to change the world you are a conscious spiritually enlightened warrior granted the gift to choose how you want to make change in the world if you help a lot of people you deserve to graduate to acquire the benefit of more comfortable a more comfortable home, a nice, safer neighborhood to live in, access to places that you want to go, proximity to the beach, proximity to, you know, whatever, wherever you want to do, proximity to, you know, a wonderful city with vibrant day life, night life, places, things to do. You know, if you make a big difference in the world and you are making a big difference in people's lives and you receive, you know, a little bit of payment from everybody that you help, then eventually you're going to change your position you're going to change your situation and you're going to be able to afford in time you know more things that make you have a better higher quality of life that's just the same game and the same rules that everybody that everybody plays um, i think a lot of people that are looking into tapping into becoming billionaires overnight um they're not happy with the slow process of slowly gradually changing your character and becoming better uh, you know over the course of time we just have to become better people in all areas and you might be a great, you know, you might have great character. You might be a great, a great, wonderful man, wonderful human being, wonderful woman. Um, but just, um, you know, if you want more things, if you want more material things, if you want, you know, to uh, live in a city that's like, more expensive or live in an area that's more expensive, and you just, just learn how to make a difference in the world. Learn how to provide services to people and charge a fair fee for yourself and just wait over time and eventually you'll save up money I mean this is just the same rules that everybody apply. I think when the same rules apply to everybody we live in a fair system uh, your community and family in the world cannot afford for someone this is like my bottom line even if you disagree your community and your family and the world cannot afford for somebody as informed and altruistically motivated as you and informed as you to spend the next 10 years of your life behind prison bars. Therefore, I implore you to really think twice about trying to access the Federal Reserve Bank accounts, quote unquote, which people are incorrectly calling TDA accounts. Godspeed. That's basically it. Now, I kind of read over something really quickly over here. Um, well, you guys can go through and reread this. 
I just want to make clear here that you know once again the birth certificates ha um, the, the, the government mortgage your life your labor your property to fund the US corporation because they are in debt and they need funds in order to create more you know everything down to the city level because it's all it's all connected the city and the county are all owned by the state which is all owned by the federal government anyway so federal corporation government anyway so when more babies are born those babies are not paying taxes right the, a, ten, a five year old doesn't pay taxes a ten year old a fifteen year old pretty much doesn't pay taxes until they get their first job so from age zero to fifteen sixteen you have someone that's not paying taxes but is is not paying into this the, the communal society that we live in yet they're pulling from it money has to come from somewhere to pay for their schools money has to pay come some from somewhere to pay for the trash removal from more more diapers and more food and more paper plates and more garbage being thrown into the garbage dumpster means there is more effort for the trash removal people there's more water there's more electricity there's more plumbing so the cities and the counties and the state overall on, at the state level uh, and at the federal level needs to provide more services more emergency you know we have more uh, more natural disasters and more hurricanes and stuff and then there's more federal emergency management there's more emergency food and bottled water and funds and stuff and and federal emergency people that are sent to these areas with fires and hurricanes and natural disasters so when you do the math and look at everything as a whole Federal, state, county, and city government need to put more money for all the new babies that are being born and all the people that are immigrating to this country, uh, legally and illegally. So it's only like later on, over time, especially with the new babies that are being born, when they eventually start to pay taxes and pay into the system, that the system actually makes money off of people. So what they do is they fund the corporation by monetizing, by mortgaging, the, the new baby's life, labor, and future property, and they create money instantly from snapping their fingers. Just like how you mortgage a house. You own your house, right? You own a million dollar house. You can go to the bank and get a million dollars just like that because you sign a mortgage. Because the bank puts a lien on your house, and if you don't pay over the course of time the million dollars plus interest so that the bank makes a profit. If you don't pay, then the bank just says, oh, we'll just hire lawyers and after a year or two, we'll foreclose on them, we'll sell the house, we'll, we'll kick them out of the house and we'll, we'll, get our, we'll get our collateral back. This way the bank knows they didn't give out a loan and then lose money and then it's a bad business practice to, to and it's unsustainable for banks to lose money. They will collapse and go under. So they securitize the collateral and put a lien on your house so now you you own the house but there's a lien on it so they basically will the bank will do a process to convert the ownership back over to the bank if you default on your mortgage so that they can own it so that they can sell it again you see how that works so the government does the same system with its citizens and that's why if you want to be free or you want your kids to be free don't opt to get birth certificates. Don't fill out the form. Don't answer the question. Oh, what do you want to name your baby? We'll don't talk to them. Don't fill out the forms. Don't register the birth. Have home births if possible and if it's safe and if you have you know everything planned and a midwife and everything planned. Like don't issue birth certificates. Don't give the midwife a name. Don't do any like like keep it private. A lot of people are doing this and don't register the birth of your kids and then their life and labor and property will not be mortgaged and the US corporation and the state and the county and the city won't get any they won't print any money out of thin air to fund the to fund society though uh, but your baby won't be able to be eligible for uh, public services you know unemployment and social security and all these things so that's just a way that they fund their corporation. That's just a, one, a way that they do it. Um, you know, the system is in debt, and they need money now, and it's gonna it's gonna be till fifteen to twenty years before that 
baby turns into an adult and starts paying taxes. So they need the money now to pay for the garbage people and the water people and everything in order to, uh, you know, to, to you know, in the city infrastructure and, you know, all, the whole system. So, you know, when you have a lot of people, new people being born every day, every week, every month, and they're not paying taxes. I mean, how, how old are you before you even start, like, paying, like, a parking ticket to the city that you that you live in? Like, you know, like, it's not until, like, you're 18 years old until you get your first parking ticket, you know, or, like, 22 years old until you get your first parking ticket. So, and how much is the parking ticket? Like, $35? So, there's got to be some way that the city raises revenue to pay for its employees to do everything. Parking enforcement, garbage disposal, you know, safety, police. police? I, I even didn't mention that. Society has to pay for police and fire people, fire department and, and, and emergency people to protect and service everybody in the school system too and educate everybody and register all the new kids for school. So there's a number of different ways, property taxes and so on and so forth, that they get funds. But another way that they get funds is by mortgaging the life, labor, and property of the newborns. If you don't agree with it, then don't register your babies. If you do agree with it and you register them, then you're, you know, contracting and supporting the system the way that it is. I'm not saying that's right or that's wrong. I'm just explaining what it is. And there's two choices and there's two options. And people that agree with things going this way can do it this way. People that disagree with things can opt out and try to live completely private and completely off the grid that way. So, you know, it's not my place to say what you should do. Uh, everybody's a different situation. Everybody's used to and comfortable, uh, you know, doing things the way that they're used to or comfortable. And I'm just putting out what I know. Um, but what I do know is uh, there's no way to successfully tap into a Treasury, Federal Reserve, bank account every single time it's been reversed. Lots of people are getting into trouble. And I think I've kind of dissected and explained Maybe not everything, but probably enough to um, you know explain to you why it's a, probably a bad idea. Again, I'm not telling you what to do, but okay. Uh, thanks for watching. The next video will be ineffective pro process being your own private banker to access funds. Believe it or not, um, many people believe that they can become their own, as their name can become their own private bank um, because remember how I set up here that the Federal Reserve Bank is a bank for banks and so only like Wells Fargo Bank of America and Chase can tap into the Federal Reserve Bank and they have to have their books balanced with assets and liabilities a lot of people believe that they are that they you know John Doe or John Smith or Jane Jones can become their own bank and that that gives them some ability to tap in and get free money. It doesn't because, again, the assets and liabilities have to balance to zero and the bank has to make money in other ways. Um, <laughs> the bank doesn't make money just because it, 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 it can tap into the Federal Reserve Bank. Okay, Chase Manhattan Bank, Bank of America do not just tap into Federal Reserve Bank and get free money and then pay their executives, pay their CEOs and vice presidents and employees through that. That's not what happens at all. They, they may tap into the Federal Reserve Bank because they're leveraging they're, they're balancing the assets, the commercial paper that the bank customers sign, and they're able to balance the liabilities, the liability funds being the Federal Reserve Banks. So they are able to pull out the or adjust their, um, adjust their books, adjust their credits that they're able to um, type. Yeah, they type it on a computer credits, and they process that through the Federal Reserve Bank. And the Federal Reserve Bank and FDIC kind of like, yeah, they kind of like create that out of thin air. But it's also like they're balancing like a like a like an insurance policy because if the bank collapses and the bank is FDIC insured, then the federal government has to come in. And because they're fully guaranteed, like the gov federal government is fully guaranteeing the bank accounts for all the consumers at Bank of America or Chase Manhattan Bank. So although they're like playing like this risky like. Russian roulette gambling game. They are creating money out thin air in a sense, but they're also playing like Russian roulette, so they have like 
they have to balance the risk and they can't just do it in an unlimited capacity otherwise it'll be like really 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 high risk um, so that's why there are certain rules and there's certain regulations and there's certain you know generally accepted accounting principles and there are generally accept, you know there's, there's a whole bunch of things that need to be in place and it's not just like you, you can't just go in and like you know print free money because it'll eventually cause the system to collapse generally accepted accounting principles a common set of accounting principles standards and procedures that companies must follow when they compile their financial statements accounting standard adopted by the US Securities and Exchange Commission I mean you can look at bank regulations I find it funny how how many like people like they work in a warehouse, they package Amazon boxes all day long for ten dollars an hour, and then they go on YouTube and they say, "Oh, we can access." You know, they think that they're an expert at understanding the banking system. You're not a vice president of a bank. You haven't been a manager of a bank. You didn't you didn't get like a PhD degree or a master's degree in banking. And there's people going on YouTube with these brilliant ideas, claiming that they can tap into these government hidden accounts, and they don't understand anything about banking. This chapter provides an overview of current U.S. bank regulatory framework at the federal level. Bank regulation is a form of government regulation which subjects banks to certain national and global economy hold on banks as important for regulatory age. I mean, do some research. The internet is a great place to do research. Dodd Frank Act, Wall Street Reform, FDIC, Office of Comptroller of the Currency, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Financial Stability Oversight Council. This is what I'm talking about. The FSOC is chaired by the Secretary of the U.S. Treasury. It comprises the heads of eight financial regulators and one independent member with insurance experience. Notably, FSOC is empowered to designate systematically significant non bank financial institutions. For supervision by the Federal Reserve. Like, read all the banking statutes, National Bank Act. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, there needs to be some um, way to prevent, you know, banks from collapsing because the, obviously the federal government is insuring all the accounts of the banks for all the uh, for all the uh, account owners, right? So. Risk management, internal and external audit. Bank capital and liquidity re uh, requirements, minimal capital ratios, risk weighted assets, uh, market risk capital charge, leverage ratio, consequences of capital ratios, stress testing and capital planning. TLAC liquidity. So, you know, why why would they need stress testing and capital planning and leverage ratios and all this stuff if everybody can just you know, like some people claim, oh the banks can just tap into the Federal Reserve an unlimited amount of times with no criteria and just create you know pull out money whenever they want or create money whenever they want. It's not true. It's not true. There are so many. Um, Restrictions, and that's not how they. That's not how they make money. They are equaling the assets. When you sign a promissory note, when you sign a, um, yeah, when you sign basically a promise a promissory note, and you go into debt with the bank, then the bank can balance that asset with liability funds, and basically, um, that's how the banking system works. So. Anyways, um, that's the conclusion of this. Throw some stuff your way. I mean, I, and unfortunately, a lot of the stuff I said maybe opens up for some really, you know, thorough researches kind of opens up a lot of, you know, I may open up more questions for some than, than are answered, depending on where you're at. But uh, anyways, I hope this presentation was helpful. 
again, onto the next presentation, people think they can be their own bank and they can access unlimited funds. It's felt funny because even like they're not like we just said liabilities need to equal assets. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know what people are thinking, but we'll, we'll go over the idea in the next presentation. Okay, thanks. This next ineffective or failed processes procedure is the being your own private banker to access funds. To remedy the shortcoming of ineffective procedure number two listed above, which we just went over about the uh, TDA accounts, people trying to access the Federal Reserve Bank on the public side or on the private side or whatever people are trying to do. Many people have tried to assert a certain status as a official, be officially being a, you know, quote unquote, private banker. The theory is, well, obviously, you're not going to become a licensed public bank like Chase or Bank of America, although it's not impossible to do. You could certainly become a bank and compete with the banks. Um, probably is a pretty expensive and involved process, but I mean, they did it, so obviously there's a way that you can do it, but some people eat some theory about how you can become a private banker and not have a banking license and then have the authority to access Federal Reserve Bank funds. Remember, the Federal Reserve Bank is the bank for banks in the United States, so being a private banker just puts you in the United States. You want to tap into the Federal Reserve Bank, then you're going to admit to being inside the United States. So if that's something you think is good, if you think something that is neutral, if you think something that is bad, do what you want from that. But that troubling thought about admitting and entering in and playing on the same playing field as the corporate de facto United States corporation that obviously uh, a lot of people in this uh, arena are trying to avoid instead of going right into the playing field of the people you're trying to avoid I guess if you set that thought aside and you can prove that you are a bank then at least you're in at least people think meaning at least you're accomplishing your goal of what you're trying to do right for the past 20 years people have been trying this only to fail and be thrown in jail even if there is some theoretical basis for being a bank and getting free money from the Federal Reserve, I mean, you can do activities that banks do, be a private banker in your own jurisdiction, like on an Indian reservation or in your own private membership association, and you need no authority to do so if you're only interacting with members of your private community. So I don't know, you know, I mean, you can, basically what I'm saying here is, you, you know, if you have your own place or your own community and your own private association you I mean you can you can you can do the things that banks do you can loan money you can sign and accept promissory notes you can do all sorts of things that you can do outside the United States and not need the United States not need the Federal Reserve Bank you can create your own system this does that's not illegal but what people are trying to do instead of, of, of that is instead of creating their own system with their own members Instead, people are actually trying to access the United States Federal Reserve Bank's funds. Again, playing right into their playing field and accessing money that's that's not yours, being an unlicensed bank. And or trying to pay money into the public to pay public U.S. debts or claiming any authorization from the Federal Reserve or Secretary of Treasury or any U.S. official when none exists. This has proven to land those to be locked up. Well, because obviously, because well, obviously they are not authorizing you to be a bank and tap into the Federal Reserve Bank. Again, you're not a licensed bank. You're not following all the protocols that Bank of America and Chase and Wells Fargo have done. So obviously, trying to um, do things unconventionally by stealth through your own belief that you've done. It doesn't matter what you what you believe in your own concocted theory. It matters what I mean. If you if you want to create your own bank, go for it. But again, you're not going to be able to tap into the Federal Reserve Bank and just become a billionaire just because you're the president of the bank. That's not how the president of the bank gets paid. Liabilities need to equal assets. 
as a private banker on your own land with your own members, surely, to my awareness, you can, theoretically, if you did that, I guess you can take notes, bills, loans from friends and juggle and leverage them all you want to make a profit, holding all the notes and bills in your own vault, in, in the bank vault, or if you run the bank out of your home, uh, although, you know, it would be a little bit less secure, and probably you can make some money <coughs> if you have the wherewithal and the knowledge and the experience to do this, obviously you could probably make some money. Like if you went to some, let's say like New Zealand, some like island somewhere that had a decent population but did not have any banking system and you create, you know, you were the only bank in town and you created your own bank, uh, I'm sure, you know, you could make a decent profit. But, uh, my uh, caution is don't try to be a, quote, private banker in the United States and then go into the public and access Federal Reserve Bank funds unless you want to go to jail. That's just my two cents. Well, my two cents doesn't really matter. It matters what the, what the cases show and what people's experience is. So let me just show you some proof below. This guy got a 120-month jail sentence. That's 10 years in federal prison for issuing, quote, what he called, quote, instruments based off of the authority he was his own private bank. Here below are the files from the United States District Court in the Western Division of Missouri, Western Division. You decide, but the conclusion is pretty clear. 120 months for fictitious obligations and mail fraud. You decide if he was right or if he was wrong, but the conclusion is he's in prison. Um, you are not a bank and you cannot create money or access such Federal Reserve accounts. Private banker gets 10 years. Uh, it was further part of the scheme and artifice to defraud that Hardin falsely claimed that he was allowed to issue bonded promissory notes because he was a private banker and that he was the owner of the private bank of Denny Ray Hardin, which Hardin operated out of his residence in Kansas City, Missouri. Guess we're zoomed in. It is further part of the scheme and artifice to the fraud that Hart this is like this is like a zooming in on the uh, the indictment. It was further part of the scheme and artifice to the fraud that Harden would mail a well, uh, would mail a bonded promissory note to creditors. The bonded promissory note was issued to and by United States Postal Service registered mail and would place the registered mail number on the bonded promissory note to falsely and fraudulently provide the appearance of legitimacy to the worthless documents. It was further part of the scheme and artifice to the fraud that Hardin would send various documents along with the bonded promissory note to creditors. The bonded promissory note was issued to, including a letter from Hardin stating that by the enclosed payment, this account is paid in full. I expect that the account will reflect this within the customary 10 days as allowed by law, etc., etc. So anyways, this is the guy's case. United States of America versus his name. Um, 11 counts of violating... 18 U.S.C. subsection 514 and 2, fictitious obligations, counts 12 through 15, Title 18, Criminal Code of the United States, sections 1341 and 2, mail fraud, and uh, counts 16 to 21. So 20, 21 count indictment, judgment in a criminal case, count numbers 1 through 21, Convicted, signed by the judge. When was this? 2000. What year was this? I don't know what year this was. Uh, 2012. Yeah, and then you've got imprisonment. Defendant is hereby committed to the custody of the United States Bureau of Prisons to be imprisoned for a. Hold on, let me. I just want to make sure that everybody can kind of see. Bottom line is right here. Imprisonment. The defendant is hereby committed to the custody of the United States Bureau of Prisons to be imprisoned for a term of 120 months on each count, the terms to be served concurrently. Alright, so, I mean, that should that should be enough proof telling you not to do this. That's basically it. I mean, um, there are others. It just, I've spent well more than a year trying to write write all this up and show the proof and put the little circles and lines under everything but there's many more instances of more people going to jail for uh, being their own banker and claiming that they're issuing uh, money instruments 
under the authority of being their own bank. So uh, that's it. This will be a shorter video. Thanks for watching. Next is ineffective procedure number four. Writing accepted for value language on your bills and mailing them to the IRS expecting they will pay your bills or cancel your bills. Either 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 theory. Some people think it's paying, some people think it's canceling or discharging. Here's an example. Well, this is an example actually of writing it on an IRS bill. But this process, I'm really talking about people writing this language in regards to any bill and sending it to the IRS. So even you have a phone bill, you have a hospital bill, and you write this type of language and you write it on the bill itself. It could be the phone bill, the medical bill, the credit card bill, and then you still mail it to the IRS even though it's not an IRS bill. Okay, now that is a process that's been around now for at least 12 years that's been went viral on the internet um, due to some people's YouTube videos, etc. So um, this is what we have to say about this. Accepting for value is a real act and can be a piece of a larger process, a legitimate technique, and can get you somewhere when doing a whole discharge procedure. It's part of the whole procedure. I have done it myself and for dozens of people successfully. The A for V document is only 1 to 2 percent of the actual complete discharge process. So, um, you know, people have done just this on their bill and mail it to the IRS and then they just cross their fingers for weeks or months and wait to see and try to hope that their bills get canceled. So what, what I'm saying is there's about, you know, 50 times more work than just this to do a discharge correctly after you're a secure party. So the two main things we will use for we will use the A for V force to claim back and cancel one's birth certificate and or social security account, social security contract, social security card, which is done with the secured party creditor process. So writing accepted for the, the main things, so the reason I the reason I say this is you can write this on bills. You can write this on statements, invoices um, bills, but the main thing that we use accepted for value for is writing it on your birth certificate and writing it on your social security um, card or a copy of your social security card, which is done um, to claim back the rights that you've given away and to basically take control and claim that that is your private property and that you are canceling the adhesion contracts and implied contracts and accounts that have been derivatives from that original registration of that document which was done without your consent and, and so that has to be done in conjunction with your UCC filing and the language on your UCC filing stating on public record that you're canceling the birth certificate registration contract retroactively for fraud. So that's that's part of the secure party creditor process. What we call the secure party creditor process, quote unquote. It's, you know, it's a lot more than just a, than just becoming a secure party creditor. It's doing it's obtaining your sovereignty, it's setting yourself up to enable yourself to discharge debts, it's reserving your uh, your you know your unalienable common law rights similar to the rights in like the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. You know, it, it's creating a private trust, it's protecting your assets, it's teaching you how to, um, you know, operate a private trust or a series of a series of them. So this, the, what we call the secure party credit process, does all those things plus makes you the living man or woman a secure party and a priority lien holder over your all caps uh, public trust name. So, you know, just FYI, we call it secure party credit process, but it does about those six or seven things that I just mentioned. One of them being making you a secure party creditor, the other five of them being uh, not related. They're somewhat related, but they're, they're, they're separate. 
Secondly, after you are a secure party creditor, have done the whole secure party credit process, doing all those things, like all those six or seven things I just mentioned, we then would A for A for B except for value. Court documents in a court case, statements or an invoice for a private loan or a, dish, or, or a, a, a hospital bill, credit card bill of a civil nature uh, in which there's no court action present. Or if you had, like I said, if it was even if it was a civil matter and you got a summons and complaint, you can accept for value the summons and complaint. I don't. This this whole money order situation is really also like combining A for V and money order, but. Uh, I don't think we're going to... Okay, we do cover the money order section. So commonly when you see on the internet, people write this across their bill and then they fill out the money order section and they write all sorts of money order type, money order ask type stuff to convert the payment voucher into a money order. Accepted for value is used to claim ownership over a document once you have your common law copyright over your name, which is accomplished in the secure party credit process. Writing accepted for value across the document is used as part of an overall process to take away the legal effect of the demand or order being sent to you. So again, accepted for value takes away and nullifies the legal effect um, and is effective when you have a whole bunch of things set up. But um, if you're at that stage and ready to do it, what you're doing is taking away the legal effect of the statement being sent to you. So does it does that in a sense discharge the obligation possibly? Uh, possibly not. You know, if you had ten different statements and invoices, and you only accepted for value one of them, if you know, would that alone it, it, that might invalidate that document, but it might not invalidate the nine other documents that may, you know, that that still, you know, still by themselves not being accepted for value do not invalidate the total account. So what I'm saying is there's there's a way of looking at it where okay, I'm canceling this statement, but what if there's another statement sent before or after with a slightly different balance due on a different date? So really what you need to do is set for value all of the documents related to that account that you've ever received from that company. And if you want to go a step further, the whole original statement, the whole original contract that created it. You know, that cre the whole contract that created the obligation and all the statements you've ever gotten, P possibly, right? So that's, you know, that's, that's in, in a sense, just, just trying to give you the mindset of how this can be used, <clears throat> which being the case of taking away the legal effect of the document and or all the documents that you receive from this uh this company or, or it's a court case and you've you know done this on every page of the complaint and the summons in a lawsuit if you took away the legal effect of the document there is no need to pay or create any other fake money order below as in this visual example below in the process that's being used by many people so I don't, so some people say oh you accept for value blah 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 then they don't explain what it is and then they say now you gotta create a money order because you have to pay the bill well, why are you paying the bill if you've taken away the legal effect of it and and the and the whole account your your position is the whole account doesn't exist. So why would you then claim that it does exist and make a money order and say pay the order of and then why would you say pay the order of you know okay. Even though this this is an IRS bill, I should have used like a phone bill or a hospital bill. But even if this was a hospital bill, what people are teaching people to do for the last twelve years is to write pay to the order of United States Treasury in the amount of whatever the you know whatever the bill is so I don't know why they're saying pay the order of United States Treasury I don't know why they wouldn't just say pay the order of you know blah 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 like medical hospital um, but either way people are writing pay the order of United States Treasury because that's what they're copying from people on the internet and the bottom line is these processes are not working and they don't work and uh, uh, you know, people have done them and nothing happens and they don't work so There is some misinformation out there that you can simply write the A for B language on a statement and mail the payment and write money order. Uh, fill out the bottom money order section below and send it to the Internal Revenue Service at stop 4440 in Ogden, Utah, and it will pay the debt, quote unquote, which doesn't make any logical sense for a number of reasons. But what's important is not me spending another five pages here sharing with you why the process doesn't logically make sense, 
What's important is to simply report that it doesn't work at all so that you get the truth and don't have to get your hopes up and also that you don't make any decisions just yet about not paying certain bills and expecting that the IRS will pay your bills if you send them a fake money order. We believe that, for whatever reason, this simplistic A for B combination of money order process is just pure misinformation or false information. I'm, again, I'm not saying the people sharing with it are all you know, bad people. They may actually believe in it, believe it works, whatever. For whatever the reason, this, from my research, from my team's research, it, we believe is ineffective and will not result in any success when duplicated. It will categorically not be effective in helping to pay or discharge a bill when done by itself. So, therefore, you can make decisions that there is a debate. Some people, I guess, might still believe it works. I don't believe it works, so you can make your own decisions. Some people in the past have found some bills spontaneously forgiven or eliminated due to various reasons. Very common with a second mortgage in a home, as there's a tax benefit to forgiveness of a debt, a 1099C being issued, and the company receiving a tax credit and actually making a profit, as well as a plethora of other reasons. They rather close your account mark zero instead of paying lawyers and future debt collectors to keep you know paying for mail and sending you mail or paying lawyers to examine your documents to respond to you so sometimes they just cancel out and say based on our algorithm we don't think this person's ever gonna pay let's not send a mail every three months for the rest of his life let's just cancel it so that we can close down our accounts and uh, it'll be better for our company overall think about it if the account or bill is only three hundred dollars why would a company pay $400 for one hour of the company's in-house attorney? Or why would they subcontract out to a lawyer from a law firm if the bill is only $300? So obviously they're not going to spend more than $300 or even close to $300 trying to collect $300. There's, there is another reason that small bills and some, even some, sometimes some citations or tickets will just be eliminated. If the cost of even reviewing how to respond to your letter is more than the bill itself, then it sometimes will just be canceled just to save the company time or money. This does not mean, though, that your process was correct or what caused the debt to be eliminated uh, will work for other people. It's just coincidence. A careful examination of many similar accounts with various balances, including much larger ones, need to be done and with more numbers of people in order to draw conclusions, and this is what UCL has been doing. Uh, since 2010 yeah for most people wanting less stress or problems in their life the least amount of work comes when you actually just pay if it's a small bill if you just pay the small reoccurring normal bills it actually is a lot less stress and a lot of work than trying all sorts of different uh, things uh, sometimes again I'm not I'm not trying to make a blanket statement for everybody I'm just saying for normal people that want less stress in their life and can't heavy the heavy workload of reading and studying and understanding a whole ton of law information sometimes the least amount of work is just to pay your small bills the reason is because your time and energy payoff versus the result of what of, of how that makes your life better is uh, is actually better for you in what your time is worth to just pay the bill than to try to figure out how to get rid of the bill and it not work so does your does your effort and does your time pay off for you if it's only a small a small bill. You know, sometimes you can even just call the hospital if it's a hospital bill and you can just, or if it's an unpaid credit card bill and you haven't paid the credit card company in a year. Sometimes you can just call them and negotiate with them and say, what if I pay, you know, I owe you $3,000, what if I pay you 1500 And about a two-minute phone call saves you $1,500. So, um, now, if you have a $100,000 unpaid student loan, if you have, you know, uh, you know, you owe five million dollars due to a judgment. You know, if you have um, a crazy ex-spouse trying to unfairly take as much money and custody of your children as they possibly can in a in a bitter divorce dispute, those are different scenarios, right? Uh, that's a different scenario. You know, if it would take you your whole life to pay a debt back, or or, or a huge portion of it thereof, where it's something worth fighting. That's a completely different story than a $125 bill. <clears throat> now, the next thing to consider here is that, especially on these like recurring bills for services that you want to keep, like like you want to keep your phone, if you want to keep your phone bill with Verizon or whatever, I've I've seen people discharge or attempt to discharge their Verizon bills. 
Now, whether or not they actually got discharged through this process or whether the company just saw this and said, and they have like a protocol where if people try to send this, they just close their accounts down anyway. I think that's what happened. But the uh, individuals that I follow that sent this to a phone company, yeah, the account was closed, but they lost their phone number, they lost their account, and they lost the ability to get service with that phone company, I believe forever or maybe for a long number of years. Uh, and they basically blacklisted blacklisted you. So, um, you know, if you want to be in good standing with the companies, you want to pay them for their services. If you try to discharge something, the company does not have to do business with you or can and will close your account and even risk not doing business with you forever, potentially. On the federal debts, if you discharge a government debt, forget about ever receiving a federal loan or grant from them ever again as you will be blacklisted although you know a lot of people don't really that doesn't really face them anyway and that's and that's and that's fine you know a lot of people I talk to are not looking to get another federal federal loan but I, I'm just saying if you're young and that's a consideration for you and you may want to get other federal loans to you know federal back student loans things like that just uh, you know look at the cost benefit if you have a government debt and it's huge it will, for most people, probably be worth it. But if it's small, and you are, you know, reasonably close or and capable of paying it off anyway, you might want to go back to school and get, you know, a big student loan. But and that's what you want to do. Then just consider that, you know, in a nutshell, you can't bite the hand that feeds you. You know, if you discharge your phone bill with your phone company, they don't have to provide services to you anymore. If you discharge discharge a federal government debt, they don't have to provide services to you anymore. The other reason that this average working American trying to, that the average working American trying to financially survive may just be in your interest to just pay your reoccurring normal bills, electric, water, cable, phone, is that you want to maintain a good credit rating. Your credit report reflects if you pay your bills on time and if banks or others should do business with you on attractive and favorable terms. Discharging or canceling debts instead of paying them can reflect poorly on your credit report for a period of time or forever. Although our company can do it in a way where your credit is cleaned, it still is better for you to have the accounts open. As many accounts open that you're paying on gives you a better credit rating, if credit rating is important to you. I'm just throwing this out there. I'm not saying that this is what you need to focus and be concerned about. I'm just saying if having the best credit rating possible is important to you. Although we can cancel certain debts and uh, keep or uh, make your credit good at all, again, um, it's always going to be better if you're paying on, on the bills and you have the accounts open, generally, generally speaking. Like 90% of the time, I mean, there's a lot of different factors and scenarios we'd have to look at, but 80-90% of the time, if you keep paying monthly payments on the bill, on the bills normally it keeps your credit high so if you're at a position where you're looking to use your credit over the next couple of years to buy a home or to finance a car or to finance a business or something like that um, you know don't just jump on to canceling debts and possibly hurting your credit report most will want a good credit rating to buy a home one day with a low down payment modifying the terms of an existing loan like lowering or modifying your mortgage payment or getting approved for a lease or an auto loan so these things these are things to seriously consider if you're in a position of possibly needing the best possible credit especially with the, with the timing you know I'm not saying don't discharge the bills ever I'm just saying look at the timing and look at what's the most important to you if those items are less important to you than discharging the enormous amount of debt hanging over your head and you care less about your credit at this time and you are willing to deal with the prospects of having to slowly rebuild your credit back up if your credit is damaged then contact us to talk it out and we'll hopefully give you some guidance on making the best decision for you we'll let you know if we can uh, essentially guarantee a, a discharge for that particular um, type of situation uh, again we have to it's, it's very particular to tell you if we're confident that it will work because certain things are working, certain things are not working, and those things can change. So, you know, please contact us if you believe that we're the best source of information to give you uh, answers in that area, to give you honest answers in that area. 
And again, you'll need to be a secure party creditor as well, otherwise um, we are not capable of you know, giving you a process with an expectation of a successful discharge. It's just not what we've seen, it's not what we've experienced, it's not what we, be we believe. And, uh, you know, maybe there's others out there that do things differently, but from us, you need to be have that whole SPC process. We have an entire page on our website dedicated to educating people about the wrong and right ways to use Accepted for Value. If you just go to our website, understandcontractlawnewin.com, and on the right-hand side, scroll down and click on the Accepted for Value Doesn't Work link. We explain the misconceptions of why it doesn't work the way people believe what it is and the way people believe it works. We kind of explain that. Yes, I'll point it out and show it to you. Got the page zoomed out a little on the right hand side. Usually we have this little A for B doesn't work. Read why here, guy scratching his head. Sometimes we have a different logo, we rotate the logo. Why doesn't my A5A work? So this was posted in December 2016. It's been up here. It's been up here for years. You can read it. It's a nice little FAQ. And there's also an audio link. You can download the reading of this uh, audio link if you don't want to read it. If you just want to like close your eyes and lay on the couch and hear me reading it, then you know you can do that. You can learn more of visiting here since we've already written exclusively about it. Okay, there's the link. And then you would see the audio lesson section of our website for further lessons. Audio lessons. And you've got some other lessons here related to the same topic. Um, discharging and all sorts of different things. Credit, understanding credit scores. You know, so on that little tangent there, you can click that and listen to that and check some of these extra audios out because they're related to this uh, to this presentation. So, you know, I'm not going to go over. I've already, you know, cross-referenced a link that's been up there for years that you can read it or you can listen to it, and it kind of talks more about the accepted for value process. But in a nutshell, I have explained it here. I've explained what it is. I've explained what it not is. I've explained that simply writing accepted for the accepted for value language and including a money order with it uh, or what you what you deem is a is a money order with the bottom ripoff payment coupon part is not a successful process that we have observed to be having any degree of reliable success so we just wanted to put that out there and um, again I'm not telling people what to do I'm not telling people what not to do I'm just sharing the results of my research and I hope that uh, you all appreciate it. The next presentation will be on the 1099 OID theories in conjunction with filling out tax returns in relation to the OID theories. So that'll be next. Thanks for watching.